Yes. So Theo Bronskill, uh, you come through the Mosley clan, right? I'm Mosley Pritchett, mostly, um, yes, Mosley Pritchett Clark. Okay, Pritchett. So, okay. and of course, Clarks are everywhere. <laughs> so, um, uh, Connie DiMalanta, who's on the call, she is Lumby, but she's grown up in Philadelphia all her life. She knows everybody. She does the inter intertribal circuits. She's been in cultural center work all her adult life. And Dolores yeah. Stanford, she's from, um, she's a citizen of the Millsboro, Nanticoke. And she also grew up in Philadelphia, but she knows, you know, she's participated in intertribal work all her life too. So now you know each other. I'm so happy. <laughs> uh -huh. she, I recognize you. This lady here with glasses, I recognize you. That's Ruthann. That's Julia. Which glasses? Oh, Julia. <laughs> Julia. Yeah. Well, that's what you said mm -hmm. you were with me at, at a gathering, right? Yeah, at Tony and Jan Durham. Probably. I went to all of them, you know, for years. I probably, with your sister. I can, I probably oh, God, since I was 50. Before she was that. with her sister, Julia. Okay. In my 40s. All right. Mm -hmm. Say your sister's name I'm, for us. I'm, I'm with, was friends with Bill Davis and um, Doris. And um, they were the... Um, and Sylvia. Uh, and Sylvia. <laughs> right. Yeah. I call them during the holidays to find out how they are because they're up there in their... Oh God, 80s, so late 80s or 90s. Hey, everybody say a prayer for Miss Anna because she's really suffering right now. I was asking about her yesterday. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk out of school, you know. There's nothing, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing in the church bulletin or anything, but I'm just asking you. Yes. We'll remember her and hold her and the whole yes. family. Mm -hmm. I get sometimes I get those certain things in my newsletters. Yeah, well, they're not talking about it much, but they took her to the hospital. The hospital said just take her home, um, and that was really hard. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we all just need to remember the whole family is struggling, you know, because yeah. it's hour after hour of one hundred percent attention. So, yeah. oh, my about, heart's a little heavy right there. Sorry to interrupt. And uh, little, Betty Sini's funeral was today. Ruth Ann, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we have about two minutes before we're going to get started. Uh, so right now we're just kind of chatting and, you know, seeing who's on the, on the call so far. Uh, but we do have a very packed schedule, which is great. I'm glad we're going to have like so much great information shared on today's call. Uh, but in order to make sure- that, Can you introduce yourself for the- New people? Oh, yeah. For people who don't know who I am, my name is Ron. I've been working with uh, Mural Arts Trash Academy Environmental Justice Institute uh, since 2016. I'm also the convener of the Trash Circle, and I am on the Strategy Circle, and I'll be uh, facilitating today's meeting. Um, Hi, so it's going to be, thank you. Nice Hello. to meet you all. It's going to be my, uh, you know, Thankless, thankless test to try to keep us on time today. So please don't be offended if I you know, interrupt you at some point to say you sure. have two minutes left or something like that. Um, we just have okay. a lot of people to get to. Uh, but I think, I think we'll have enough time for everyone to say everything they need to say. And I would just make sure, I, I would ask you to make sure that if you have something really important that you wanna say, don't save it for the end of your presentation. Um, put it more towards the beginning to make sure that you have enough time to get that really important information in there. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started in about a minute. Uh, with our project overview. And yeah, just welcome everyone. I'm glad to see everybody here today. And I'm looking forward to getting started. Okay. We could get started. I don't think really know. Her yeah, well. I knew her from Millsboro. But did she ever go to Bridgeton? Did you ever go to Bridgeton Powwows? Okay. Yeah. Julia? Yeah, Bridgeton. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I know you mm -hmm. from. I, I go. I've been with there's a Doris and Joyce and Theo, so we're usually sitting around in the same area. Yeah, but you look so familiar, both of you. <laughs> it's been years. Yeah. 
Yeah. Nice. And, I always hang out with, and I always hang out with Bright Dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> so very so very shortly mom. very shortly they're probably going to put us on mute so that they can start the program and i do not see canon on here so i'm going to call him on the telephone okay thank you i think we can get started um it's 2 10. Thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate everybody taking the time on a Saturday. Um, most of the people we need to be here are here. I just wanna, can we start with the, uh, the schedule for today? Um, the next slide. Yeah, so this is just an overview of the schedule. So we're gonna do a project overview just so you know people who aren't familiar with what we're doing, they can understand what the project is. And then starting at 2.15, we're gonna have Ruth Ann and her friends um, and uh, coworkers, they're gonna speak for 20 minutes. Then we're gonna have Chief Mann speaking for 20 minutes. We're gonna have multiple speakers, recorded voices and stories for 25 minutes. Then we're gonna have Indigenous 215, then Chirito, then general questions and answers. We're gonna have a break for about 10 minutes from 3.55 to 4.05. Then Gabriella, Iglesias Garden, Akibalan, and then we're gonna end with general questions and answers. All right, so as you can see, we have a lot of speakers to get to. Um, so we're gonna start with a general project overview for those who may not be familiar with what this project is, just so you can understand what we're doing. So uh, we're uh, Mural Arts. Uh, you know, the Environmental Justice Institute is a program within Mural Arts. We're the, nation, we're the nation's largest public arts program. And, you know, we're dedica dedicated to the belief that art can ignite change and help, you know, um, inspire change in our communities. The Environmental Justice um, Institute grew out of uh, a program called Trash Academy. And what we're trying to do with this Environmental Justice Institute is build community capacity to solve the problems in our own communities, right? And we want to work in a way that is horizontal, so it's not like top down with, uh, you know, like a boss at the top dictating everything. We want to work in community with people and actually share ideas and share resources. We want to um, re-knit the social fabric because you know our society is really falling apart there's so many different problems and so many different challenges uh we're trying to use art and community building to really help solve our problems especially a lot of these environmental issues that we're dealing with um next slide please so from trash academy and restore spaces to the environmental justice institute i think as i mentioned earlier when i first got involved with uh, uh mural arts it was through trash academy and Trash Academy was a program that was brought in to help um, community members solve the trash crisis in uh, Philadelphia, but starting in South Philadelphia. And through our research and through our work in the communities, what we started realizing is that um, not only is uh, trash an environmental justice issue, but it's also linked to historical injustices like redlining and the historical disenfranchisement of people of color. Um, we're, we're, we're the ones who are exposed to these environmental harms. And uh, many people never view trash as an environmental justice issue, but we definitely felt that it was. And we organized around that and we helped to, uh, we helped to organize and bring in Philadelphia's uh, plastic bag ban. So that, was, that really helped boost us within the organization and helped us to, uh, to form the Environmental Justice Institute. All right, next slide, please. I remember that because we I remember that because we called it graffiti network. Yeah, <laughs> right. Back in those days, when yeah, the mural arts. They, they, they were trying to cut. They were trying I've to done use. Murals. I've done murals. Oh, great! Yeah, we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to have a, a few mural projects that hopefully y'all can get involved in later on. Um, so we did uh, before we started this project. We did some pre-project research. I'm just going to run through really quickly some of the things that we've learned. <clears throat> The frontline communities are people who are the ones who are the most exposed to these environmental bads, like climate change, disasters, like uh, pollution, things like of that nature. And we realize that art can be used by environmental justice movements to shift the narrative, which the narrative is usually blaming the victims. It's usually saying that, oh, well, you know, it's all personal responsibility. The corporations get off the hook. The government gets off the hook. Uh, we're trying to change that whole narrative and say that no, these institutions are the ones who are pushing all of this and they're kind of forcing us all to go along with it, right? 
And we're also saying that art can also serve EJ movements by creating networks um, of opportunity and networks that can uh, collaborate with each other to uh, build the kind of change that we need. So what we're gonna be doing in addition to the mural um, is these creative disruptions. <clears throat> and what a creative disruption is, it's a contentious strategy to disrupt the status quo. Um, these are very effective, but they're often underfunded in environmental justice movement. Okay, next slide. Please. Next slide. Okay, so th these are the project components. As you can see, there's three main uh, spheres, air, trash, and land. And then supporting these three main uh, uh, project components are the uh, communication circle, strategy circle, advisors, art circle. Uh, we have a narrative and messaging component that we're gonna do with story-based strategy. And this is all going into three main things, the mural, uh, which will hopefully be at CCP uh, near Center City, uh, the hub space, which is gonna be connected with the mural, which is a place where people will be able to have programming and invite the community to do teach-ins and speak out some things of that nature. Um, and then after that, we're gonna be doing the creative disruption, which is gonna be this big artwork project that will help disrupt the status quo and really put the message out there that we're trying to get out there. Um, next slide, please. So what are the content circles? Trash, land, and air. And I, I know some of you are wondering, why isn't it land, air, and water? I think we're, normal, we're used to that. But here in Philadelphia and in our surrounding area, trash is such a huge issue and it's what, um, as I mentioned before, the Environmental Justice Institute is based on. So we wanted to include that because it's such a huge um, environmental justice issue in our, in our, in our area. So uh, these circles are led by a member of a frontline community. They're supported by uh, climate and EJ artists. We also have allied supporters and we are also getting support from Ural Arts. So now Shari is gonna talk a little bit more about um, the details of the art aspect. Next slide. So this is the phase we're in right now. We call them create-a-thons, but in fact, they're really basically teach-ins. And so this is the knowledge sharing that we're doing. And um, we expect to be done this phase, the beginning of May. Um, next slide. Then there comes some mural design and mural painting. And actually the design reviews for the mural design are part of phase one, but people who wanna be involved with the mural painting, it won't be right for everyone, but it'll be right for some groups can participate in phase two and we'll plan how to do workshops with COVID restrictions. Next slide. And that is an example, that's our shipping container. You can see it in the background, those tables and chairs fit inside of it. And that's our hub space. So it's a very, outdoor breezy learning space, but we can also continue to use Zoom meetings and things like that for when we do workshops and um, sharing knowledge in the fall. Next slide. There's an example of a creative disruption because some of you saw that right around um, the get out the vote effort. And that was a project that was funded by the Center for Art and Activism, the dancing mailboxes, but it really, it was a fun way of, um, it disarmed people about uh, getting out to vote. Next slide. And this is from the Climate March in 2014, but one thing I wanna point out is that back banner. Um, the back banner, I don't know what just Sorry, happened. Sorry, I apologize. I was hitting the backspace and apparently it actually took us back in the slides. Tell me when. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> This one, yes? Next one. There we go. Yes, yeah, so uh, the thing to notice is that back banner, front lines of crisis, forefront of change. And that was the messaging that they all agreed on regardless of our, their identity. So there are people from Rockaway, from you know uh, Hurricane Sandy, there's all different kinds of people. So that's an example of um, a shared message where people could keep their own identity, but create an important message, a headlining message you know, most murals don't have a headlining message. This is a little bit different what we're going after, but there are no climate justice. There are no environmental justice murals in Philadelphia and very few nationally. So we really wanna use this opportunity to um, 
develop a clear message together. Okay, I think that might be it. Is there one more slide or is that it? Done, okay. So now we can thank get started. You. Yes, thank you, Shari. So now we can get started with our presenters. Uh, first, we have Ruth Ann and her cohort. Um, please, whenever you're ready, you can get started. Welcome to Lenape Hoking and the stories of the Lenape and their lands. Um, can I move the slides? Can I change the slides? Am I host? No, I have my screen shared. So you just say next slide and I'm happy to move it along. Oh, for you. Okay. So my name is Ruth Ann Purchase. I am living and working in the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware Federal Census District. I do cultural mapping work and supervise recruit and supervise student interns to facilitate cultural mapping of the Lenape diaspora. Next slide. Uh, Dolores Stafford, and I spelled her name wrong, Stanford, is Nana Coke from the Millsboro, Delaware, and Connie D. Melanta, who I also spelled her name wrong, is Lumby from North Carolina. So we will fix them before it goes up on the website, right? <laughs> Um, they both grew up in Philadelphia, but relate to their tribal communities very strongly, and they're heading up the Native American House Alliance. Next slide. Canon Klein will also be with us shortly. He's actually in uh, traffic, but he is a senior in high school at Milford, um, Delaware, a citizen of the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, and a dancer and singer and drummer and artist and plays lacrosse, a stunning young man on his way to Cornell University to major in earth and atmospheric science. So we're very excited to have all these guests with us. We also have video clips of uh, Chief Quiet Thunder and Chief um, Coker of the um, Chief Quiet Thunder is of the Bridgeton Lenape in New Jersey, and Chief Coker is of the Cheswold Lenape. So we are grateful that all these wonderful voices have come together today because of the mural arts program. Thank you for bringing us together. And there are quite a few other elders on the phone we'll introduce later. Next slide. Uh, Lenape Hokink, Hakesanisipu Paseyank. This is the land of Lenape. Uh, where we live and breathe and um, relate to all living things. Uh, Lenape Hokink is uh, encompassing the Delaware and Hudson River Valleys historically. That is the footprint of the language group. And um, I'd like to show us a film right now about how important it is to say where we are and who the original people are. Could you click this diplomacy of land acknowledgement and just click play, it's already queued. This is a very short clip. Wherever I go on God's green earth, I do the Lakota tradition of acknowledging the four directions, the land and the people living there. Unchimaka, as I call Grandmother Earth, the land, I view her as a, a sacred, you know, living entity. And that's why we acknowledge it in, you know, Lakota thought and philosophy. As a Native person, I'm ready for any kind of confrontation that might come up, or I'm preparing myself to remind people of all those things that they forget about. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis, and the room was primarily non-Native people. I was in a non-Native organization. But this executive director got up and said, OK, we're going to get started. So everybody you know, was sitting down and getting quiet. And she said, I'd like to get started by acknowledging the indigenous culture of this, of Minnesota. And I was like, first, I was like, wow. And it just made everything like fall away a little bit for me. My guard went down. I was more relaxed because by saying that, like, that means she understands something that is just like you can't talk about, right? There's just, it just relaxed me as a minority, as a woman, and as a Native person. Like, it just, like, like pulled away this layer that's always there, you know? It was super cool. We're at a, we're at a time where um, non-Native cultures are understanding 
the traditions of indigenous peoples for, for probably the first time in our histories. So like when I go to New Zealand, the protocol is to acknowledge each other's ancestors and your mountains and your rivers. And, and, and that's such a beautiful tradition. When people are in that space and say, we acknowledge who you are, this land, the, where your people come from, they're saying, we acknowledge a relationship, but we're also creating that relationship. So this is a good thing. The important thing would be that folks would then sit with that. Like, what does it mean that our settlement is occupying this space? And what responsibility do, do I have considering that legacy to these contemporary things, right? And how do I stop distancing myself from that? Ideally, that would be, for me, the impact that this has. If you start acknowledging that the land that you're standing on and the space that you are in belong to people that are still here, like, make so much more room for understanding of all these other issues. It's one of those little things that, like, if it could just tip a little bit, all the, like, dominoes that could fall from it, I think are important. Okay. Thank you so much. Could we go back to the slideshow? I know that was a little bit of a long video to sneak into this presentation, but it is a huge movement among people of authenticity, integrity. This slide I'm not going to talk about because it's too incredible, too many wonderful things. But my point here is um, all the Lenape stories, many of the Lenape stories, are about change, about environmental change, about relationships with humans and the environment. There's much to learn from the ancestry of the original people here. So the Walla Mollum is um, the oldest book on the North American continent. It's an epic poem like Beowulf, and it uh, documents 500 generations of Lenape chiefs. Some people say it's just a legend and that's fine. It's very informative and science is confirming much of what it says. Um, there are various interpretations, but we can get into that another day. On the back of a turtle, if you click on that, there's a beautiful video that just artistic, um, not yet. Can you go back? There's a beautiful video right here on, on the back of a turtle and it's cued so that you can see in like, a minute and 30 seconds, an amazing way to understand that mother nature, nature is a healthcare system. And we are part of that healthy system. And these ancient teachings, the original teachings of living together well can inform our resilience and our restoration of all living things. The wampum belts are an agreement and one of the biggest stories we want to talk about today in this section is agreements that Europeans and Native Americans made to live together well. And the assumption on the part of Native Americans from the video that you will see when you click on that, I'm just summarizing here, is that Native Americans' assumption was that we were learning to live together well, and this agreement documented it. Europeans were thinking, I bought something I now own and can do whatever I want with disrespectfully. Like at that time they owned women and they owned people of color. They could own their mother earth. Native Americans could not comprehend that. So this video is very informative. Okay, change the slide please. And I'm gonna fly quickly through this lovely one, but uh, we wanna introduce one of the most ancient relatives um, all living things are relatives in, in this worldview. And the sturgeon is over like 240 million years old, um, documented by fossils. He is prehistoric. The back, his back is um, armored and he flips over. This is so brilliant. He flips over and smacks like a back flap instead of a belly flop. <laughs> he smacks the water just at dawn and dusk, he's calling all his relations to come back together. And he'll do this until a crowd forms and they travel together. They are a community and they are a resilient community. 
And they have always been here in the Delaware River Valley or Hakesimis Sipu um, Paseank. But we've forgotten to protect their ancient breeding ground. And the Lenape were documented as the first environmental advocates, nonviolent uh, direct action, taking down the colonists' dams to let their ancestors get upstream for the family reunion at the vernal equinox. How cool is that story? And we have, a doc we have documentation of so many of these aspects of life and of Native American advocacy. This is not new. <laughs> this is not new and pandemics are not new. 90% of the Lenape were dead within the first 100 years of European contact, mainly due to a smallpox epidemic every 15 years, killing the elders and killing the babies. So these sufferings are not new. And the resilience of the indigenous people of Turtle Island is not new. And we can listen to their deep wisdom and learn so much. So let me turn this over. Next slide, please. I'm gonna ask Dolores and uh, Cornelia to share a little bit and feel free to um, pick and choose what you share. Just feel free for like the next four or five minutes. Okay. First of all, my name is Cornelia de Malenta and I'm with Dolores Stanford. We wanna talk for a moment about our, our organization. We're Native American House Alliance. It is an urban nonprofit that we promote and gener general welfare of Native Americans in the Philadelphia area. There is a growing need for social services among the Native American community in Philadelphia area. There are over 6,000 Native Americans in the Philadelphia, living in the Philadelphia area and many with no ties to their culture or their tribe. We will strive to preserve and protect Native American history and culture, as well as conserve and protect Native American sites and places. We are located right in front of Penn Treaty Park at Penn Treaty Park Place for anyone who wants to know. But while we're on the subject, let's talk about Penn Treaty Park itself and the erosion that's taking place over there and um, the problem. You know, we, we're here as Native American people. We need to try to heal Mother Earth by finding ways to stop the pollution and the effects of killing all the animals who play a big part in our ecosystem. Uh, Penn Treaty Park right now has gone through some changes but there's still a lot of things that are wrong. Uh, there are condos that are building, being built right next to it. There's excuse, a- Excuse me, Connie. Excuse me, Connie. Could we yeah. show that slide while you're talking about it? Let's move on sure. and we'll do the heroes mm -hmm. later. This is a picture, a painting from Benjamin Hicks. I, you're breaking up. I'm breaking up? Can you yes, hear me, yeah. Ron? This is the yeah, picture a little, that I want you to show. There's a little bit of choppiness on their end, but I, I think I can. we can make it out. Okay, go ahead, Connie. Okay, now let's talk about this, this uh, plaque that's up that says Penn Treaty Park. You know, William Penn was a refugee of war and all the others who sailed with him that came from England, they were refugees of war. And the Quakers, they were, Quakers, they were Quakers, and the King of England actually gave them Pennsylvania to get rid of them. Now, they came here, and they met with the Lenapes, and they met with Tanaman, and they formed their treaties, and uh, they, they, they came to a treaty to live in peace and to be peaceful. And that treaty was made under that great elm tree that is no longer there. And uh, they never even mark it as the village of Shackabaxon, which they should. The thing that bothers me most is that there are 577 tribes here in the United States and not one thing that says Pentry 
city park there says William Penn and the Indians made a treaty. Why does it not say the Lenape's? Why does it not name the chief tenement? And I believe that they need to change the Indian to Native Americans because uh, now when you say you're Indian, they think you're from India. And India did not make that treaty with William Penn. You know, the, the Indians then at that time, the, the Native Americans, the Lenape's, they welcomed Penn Treaty. Uh, they welcomed William Penn into their family. And they made him a family member. They made his family members their family. And to look at the injustice now and the things that are being done there at Penn Treaty Park, if it really is historical, why can't it truly be marked as a historical place and named the Indians that, that wrote the treaty with William Penn? Say they were Lenape's. Put Chief Tanneman's name in there. There, there's, there's, there's no statues of Native Americans there at all. Mm -hmm. All the erosion and stuff that's taking place over there, they say that the beavers are coming back and they're starting to chew up the trees over there and they're, they're having a problem with that and they shouldn't have a problem with that because it's just saying that the, the river and it's, it's better for the wildlife that's around there. It's better for the fish. Uh, I think that has to do with Petty Island because it was once owned by Sitco Oil. And when they stopped all of that, I think that it started cleaning up the Delaware River some. Yeah, so can we see the next slide? All right, so this is Penn Treaty Park here. It's the green, tiny little green peninsula that sticks out. And Dolores told me that she remembers when that was a much bigger piece of land. And from the up close picture, you can see those big rocks, those big boulders. They put them there because the water is That's just where eroding. Is taking place. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and now the elders can't get down there. We have people who come there from all over the world, um, especially on World Water Day. And they bring a sample of water from their homelands. A lot of people in Philadelphia are from all over the world, and they all bring water from there wherever they can get it, and they're important places, and they bring it to this water, this city of Philadelphia, the brotherly love, and those elderly women try to get down to that water through those rocks to put their water into the Delaware Bay and allow it to become a part of the whole. It's been so hard to see this, these big rocks, and yet we know they're trying to prevent erosion. Is, is that even possible? You know, so now I don't know if Cannon's on yet. Cannon, are you on here yet? Yeah, I'm here. Yay! Cannon, can you talk, speak to this a little bit? Everybody say hello to Cannon. Woohoo! We got gotcha. you. Cannon. I already introduced you, Cannon, but you can say whatever you need to say. We're very happy to have you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Kenan Khan, and um, uh, as we're talking about uh, climate justice in Lenape Hoking, we have to ask the questions, what uh, are Lenape losing? What is possible to restore? Um, to whom it can be restored? And what barriers can we remove so that it's more possible and easier to revitalize our climate? Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about what the Lenape are losing, it, uh, it boils down to we're losing our lands, our cultural and our history. And we're also losing our ties to our animal relatives. And the bottom left is a picture from Woodland Beach, um, Delaware like around Smyrna and it's a picture of the road has been flooded and after the and so after the way at the little land that we have left in the top right uh corner that picture is of the island field site in Slaughter Beach Delaware um and that's a very historic uh burial ground um for my tribe and 
it's a very important cultural place and tells us a lot about our history. And as you can see, it's right off the bay there. And uh, it's very close to be to being submerged in water if the sea level rises anymore, um, which would be a shame because it's a very uh, important part of our culture and our history. Um, another thing that we're losing is our connection to our uh, animal relatives and uh, like fish and seafood in the bay that are being threatened and endangered from climate change and pollutants, which are traditionally um, a source of food and a means of income for Lenape people. That's all okay. I have. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? And we're gonna fly right through these. Um, in yeah, response- uh, Two minutes, just let you know. That's yeah, in response to all these struggles, we are restoring local food. We believe that local food, uh, localization in general is the best thing we can do to reduce our carbon footprint and, and slow climate change, which is um, accelerating. Next slide, please. We have a cultural mapping program. And if you get to look at this slideshow, please click on cultural mapping and scroll down. You'll see all kinds of articles about what we're doing, workshops that you can take um, regarding restoring indigenous life ways. Next slide. Um, could you click on this video? It's only a minute and a half. Man did not spin the web of life. He's merely a strand in it. Uh, and what man does to the web he does to himself. I think it's very important to um, view our society in, in, in that relationship. And we're here in the Fork Branch area of our tribal community, um, where we're trying to restore um, the ecosystem here uh, with the expectation of reintroducing the freshwater mussel. The freshwater mussel certainly is a uh, primary health indicator uh, of water quality. So that if we can get a freshwater mussel to grow out here, then it's a sign that our waters are improving in health. Okay, next slide, please. Next, next slide. One second, it's a little bit harder to click on. There we go. And skip this one. We have to we have to wrap up. But when you get to watch this later, there's all kinds of videos in here. So we're here go ahead today. And skip that. They're all very short. Wanishita, thank you all. This is um, my farewell to you because we can't carry on on and on and on. So this is my farewell slide. I want to thank everyone who participated. I am so excited to see how this all unpacks and how we learn to live together well in the Lenape Hoking with all our relations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ruthann. That was so interesting. I really appreciate the point about nature as a healthcare system. I definitely agree with that. Um, our next Oh, Ruthann and speakers, not just you. <laughs> Thank you to the other people as well. Uh, our next speaker is Chief Mann. Come on down. Is Chief Mann here? Yeah, I'm here. I just, uh, can you guys see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, you guys have my... Uh... Yes, Victoria, it's uh, actually slide... Uh... Slide number 35. Oh. Uh, uh, 
uh, Anishi Ki Shalomokwen, Elamili Ang Yong Waikish Creek, Wakukana Aki, Wakenda Wakumbi, Wakilongo Mati, Waknimbo Mouse Wakanum, Anishik, 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 Anishik. Anishik. Uh huh. Um, how are you? Uh, I'm Chief Man. I'm the Chief of the Turtle Clan of the Ramapo Lenape Nation. Uh, I come from the Ramapo River, the Ramapo Mountains, and the uh, Ramapo Muncie people. Um, thank you, Creator, for giving us this day, our Mother Earth, the fire and the water. We thank you for all of our relations, and most importantly, we thank you for our lives. Uh, and I thank the Four Directions. Um, so in front of us, what we have here is, um, you know, a traditional uh, wigwam. And um, what we're going to present here is the Ramapo Muncie Nation, our past, our present, and our future. Um, next slide, please. In uh, 1625, uh, the chief of the Ramapos in what is known now as uh, Connecticut and also as uh, Western Connecticut, Eastern New York, um, was Chief Katona. Um, Chief Katona, um, as you can see by the village there, it was uh, down to the next village with the cursor. Uh, you'll see how large, oh, one more up. <laughs> Says Ramapo, R-A-M-A-P-O. There you go. And our village at that time uh, was actually quite a large village um, on one of the main trails. Um, the one goes completely up to the Berkshires, uh, Massachusetts, probably all the way to Canada. Um, Chief Katona um, is the grandson of Ponis, um, and Tapgao was his uncle. Um, Manus is also um, a part of, of the Ramapo here. Uh, when Katona uh, disposed of all the lands, the Ramapo who were left um, crossed back across the uh, Mahikinatuk um, back to uh, the place of our origin, which is the Ramapo Mountains. Uh, next slide. Uh, Ramapo Split Rock, where uh, Reverend Ford recorded our last horn ceremony with our people in the late 1800s. Uh, we are in an active uh, role right now to um, protect uh, not just Split Rock, but you know the mountain there. Um, as you can see here, uh, there are many, many, many um, stone turtle effigies. There is a ceremonial circle um, where the stones were placed about 7,000 years ago. Um, on one side is, is Pallades and on the other side is the Big Dipper. Um, so we're working currently to, um, to keep this place protected. Um, and we still do uh, hold uh, sacred ceremonies there. Uh, when we stand up atop of this um, split rock, um, we can look out over uh, Mawa Way, uh, which is now named Mawa, which was the place, the place where people gather. Um, and we can actually look out and actually see the, you know, the, to see Manhattan as well. Um, next slide. Uh, 1923, uh, there was several canoe bottoms that were recovered uh, and verified by the Smithsonian Hay Foundation as belonging to the ancient tribe, the Ramapo. Um, these canoe bottoms are currently uh, at the Patterson Museum in uh, New Jersey, and uh, you can actually see one of them, which is on display. Um, one of the things that's really unique here um, is that this, you know, federal agency um uses the word ancient and you know for for myself you know I, I have not really seen too many other um indigenous communities where they're referred to as ancient people um there are several um multiple uh times where ramapos are mentioned in this way uh, next slide um new jersey vineland training school and the cold springs laboratory so in the early 1900s, the Ramapo found themselves to be um, the subject of eugenics, uh, where eugenics was um, being created and developed. Um, the Fords, Rockefellers, Bushes, Harrimans, um, 
were all a part of that eugenics movement. And uh, the Violent Training School in New Jersey is where, you know, part of our people were uh, introduced to. Uh, the other one is Cold Springs Laboratory in New York side. And the study of eugenics um, led to uh, coming up with 18 different ways to deal with the unwanted people of the Ramapo Mountains, um, that being us. And the number one way um, that Margaret Sanger, um, the founder of Planned Parenthood, had put forth was by a public lethal gas chamber in 1923. There was a Jewish German scientist who uh, came here to the United States and was working for the New Jersey Violent Training School. And after the study of eugenics was completed, he actually left his daughter and uh, his wife here and he headed back overseas uh, where he had eventually been uh, picked up um, there in uh, Adolf Hitler's sweep. And uh, what we can't verify, but we do believe to be the truth is that the little black Bible that Adolf Hitler carried around with him was actually the study of eugenics that was um, done on us here uh, to include sterilizations and the threat of a public lethal gas chamber. Um, next slide. Um, every year, uh, so in 1665, the Nichols, um, English Nichols governor um, and the Esopus, um, who amount to the, the Muncie people as well, um, in, 19, in 1665 had a treaty. And that treaty was to uh, be one where you know, we could reside here peacefully next to each other um, without war. And, you know, this is something that um, failed many, many times and then ultimately had a complete failure um, with the slaughter of the Sopus people. Um, and some who did remain behind and uh, it's been noted and recorded that um, a large majority of them who did survive actually came to the Ramapo Mountains and, um, you know, basically just came home. Um, every year for the last uh, four years um, in the summertime, I actually take it upon myself um, as an inherent responsibility, you know, to our ancestors to actually renew this treaty. Um, it wasn't, re it was renewed 17 times and then it wasn't renewed for over 300 um, in something years until we began to, um, to redo this. Uh, next slide. Um, Ed Lenick, he's a premier archeologist in Northern New Jersey. He has, um, for his life work has, uh, you know, been adamant about, you know, the Ramapo people and who we are and how we've lived here and has written, um, I believe three or four books now, um, he is, is a very big advocate for the Ramapo Muncie people. Uh, next page. Um, this right here is showing, you know, uh, World War I draft cards. Um, there is a plethora of them where the Ramapo um, people have been recorded as being Indians um, on them. Um, uh, next slide. This here is uh, one of our elders in regalia. Um, you know, we are very proud and prideful people. Uh, next slide. Even to our youth, you know, um, being engaged and being proud of their heritage and who they are. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a photo of uh, grandmother soaring um, hawk. Um, there was a complete photo shoot that was actually done um, of our Ramapo women um, in their regalia. And it's just amazing uh, to see this uplifted and um, honoring our women. Uh, next slide. Then we come to the Ringwood Mine Superfund site. Uh, next slide. This is a picture of two of my aunties. Um, one of them is with us today, uh, the other is not. Neither is her husband, neither is her son. Um, all died with um, health ailments from our Superfund site that we actually live in. Um, this memorial behind them started out as a memorial for um, folks who um, 
you know, had had died tragically, but then has morphed into um, a memorial within the community for those who have lost their lives due to the toxic dumping by the Ford Motor Corporation. That was, you know, permitted by the state of New Jersey for a year, um, dumping 16 million pounds of paint sludge every quarter. Um, the town of Ringwood, uh, writing a letter to uh, Henry Ford, the grand, his grandson, Henry Ford in Michigan in the 1960s, asking for all the industrial waste um, from the Mawa plant be brought to our community and dumped in the mines and on our hunting grounds and gathering grounds. Um, next slide. This right here is an example of uh, what was, you know, how it looked, um, you know, with Ford and outside other communities, uh, other municipalities. Um, there's a, there has been uh, medical waste that has been disposed of here. Um, there is the town authorized WR Grace to come through and dump PCB laden uh, cancer causing oil on all of the roads. Um, truly devastating our community and our natural world. Um, next slide. There's a documentary that was done. Um, the community, not under the Turtle Clan, but just as the community had um, sued Ford. And this documentary with my cousin Wayne Mann um, really didn't do our people the justice that it should have. Uh, the focus was more on the lawyers, you know, going to fancy restaurants. And, um, but when you watch this documentary over and over again, um, you'll start to see and hear and find certain little things that are in there that will pop up. Uh, one of those that they talk about in here is uh, dioxin. Dioxin is uh, the deadliest chemical known to humans right now. Um, dioxin was created here when Ford or its agents um, started these fires and were burning all of the stuff that they were bringing, um, not just uh, Ford paint sludge, but cardboard and, you know, metal, plastic, all kinds of things. Um, next slide. This right here is uh, one of my cousins, Elder. He is holding a chunk of paint sludge, which is not even representative um, to the amount of paint sludge that had been disposed of in and on our community. Um, that piece of paint sludge right there is it amounts to the size of a grain of salt, uh, comparatively speaking. Next slide. Um, you know, this is just us again at one of our powwows, encouraging our youth to, uh, you know, be a part of their culture, to learn it, to learn our language, to learn our traditions and customs. Um, next slide. This picture here is uh, a photo that has been taken from the top of the mountains in, um, in uh, the Turtle Clan's uh, ancestral land. And that's looking out over what was the Wanaki River um, that we lived upon, um, but what is now the Wanaki Reservoir. That reservoir feeds four to six million people in the state of New Jersey. Um, as you may or may not know, New Jersey is the most populous state um, in the country. And when one realizes that this Superfund site sits less than a mile uh, above the Wanakee Reservoir, uh, that for the last 56 years, all of these contaminants through the groundwater, surface water, um, have been leaching into Sally's Pond, um, where people fish. And uh, that actually goes into the Wanakee Reservoir and then down the cities like Newark and Patterson and Passaic and Clifton and Jersey City and even affluent communities like uh, Franklin Lakes. And, you know, for years we have tried to get the EPA to hold a citizens advisory group meeting in these towns and they have refused us. Um, these people are, you know, millions of people are stakeholders too and they should have a voice you know, and saying, you know, what happens to their water, um, like Flint, Michigan, this is Flint, Michigan on steroids. Um, it is so deep and impactful that it, the state and the federal government try not to allow this to be spoken about too loudly because 
it would be like opening up Pandora's box. Next slide. Uh, this is one of our elders, um, you know, down on a ceremonial land, which has been uh, 14 acres of controversy uh, inside of a very affluent community who hates us, who is racist to us, who just even recently have driven up next to one of our Turtle Clan members who was there, um, telling them, you know, screaming and screaming at the top of the lungs uh, while there was a young Ramapo there, young boy. Uh, and his mother telling them that they don't belong there. Uh, next slide. Uh, Chief Man, just a, a notice, uh, five minutes left. Yeah, that's nice. thank you. Um, and you know, that all came because of this right here at a Split Rock Sweetwater Camp, which was put in place to um, support um, Standing Rock. It was to support, you know, clean air, clean water, clean ground clean earth and for that you know we were faced with a you know uh two million dollars worth of fines and a community who despises us uh, next slide um you know this is a this is the seal that i created for the turtle clan but the tribal council back in the day decided that they wanted to uh to use that for the new tribal seal uh next slide uh, this is me planting uh, sweet grass at a ceremony in one of the areas in the New York side that had been cleaned up from the Ford paint sludge. Next slide. This is a picture of the Nichols Treaty Belt. Next slide. This right here, you know, the Ramapo uh, fought on the side of the Americans. We fought with the rebels, right, against uh, Britain. Uh, we're successful. Um, this right here is a William Mann. Next slide. Um, next slide. This right here, in time of pandemic, we took it upon ourselves, my wife and I, and the mutual aid groups to provide, you know, uh, food to our community in Ringwood, um, in the mines area, a super fun site, so that we could eliminate, we can minimize their exposure to COVID by going to the grocery stores. Next slide. This again is uh, us laying out the food and the community coming to receive it. Behind them is actually one of the worst parts of the Superfund site where they took the material out of there, sent it to uh, Michigan, went through the furnaces twice, and the, they called the EPA, told them to get all their workers out of there. They failed to tell us why for over a month. And it turned out that that material after being in process twice was too toxic to be buried anywhere in the, in the continental United States. Next, it's still there. Next slide. Um, you know, this is a documentary that we've created um, with Rutgers. It's called uh, The Meaning of the Seed. Um, and those seeds of hope have been planted, literally. Um, next slide. Um, this right here is a bunch of us together. Um, we were out planting ginseng um, for the benefit of our people and rewilding. Um, that is our Muncie Three Sisters Farm shirt that we have created. Next slide. Uh, this is Miss Mike Lean, the wife, and she is standing in front, sitting in front of uh, one of our um, tobacco plants that was gifted to me a few years back, and I collected the seeds, but it was from a 800-year-old pouch that had been discovered, and it was gifted back to us. Next slide. This right here is, uh, on the left, is folks planting 17,000 garlic seeds by hand uh, in the fall. And the high tunnel that you see here was donated to us and we erected it 16 by 100 feet long. Next slide. Um, this, uh, the one on the left is where we planted melons and things. And then this is last year. And then the one on the right just shows you the additional five acres that we added, which is gonna be a, medic a medicinal orchard. Next slide. Again, uh, on the left, this is volunteers. They never saw, you know, how to harvest potatoes. And you can see by her expression, she was so, um, oh man, she was just so happy. It was an incredible day. Um, in the upper left-hand corner here is one of our one of our relatives, and he had brain cancer. And uh, Miss Michaeline has been taking care of him through. Um, he had traditional, you know, uh, today's medicine, but we were treating him with mushroom uh, mushrooms and helped to help cure his uh, brain cancer. Uh, next slide. 
This again is Muncie Three Sisters Farms. So those were the potato beds. Next slide. And Muncie Three Sisters Farm. I mean, that's where I am today. Um, this year, we're actually going to be growing uh, 4.17 miles of market beds, you know, to feed our community clean, healthy food to help try to heal them, um, you know, physically and spiritually. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that come from mutual aid groups to assist us to um, do what we need to do. We've had no help from the state, from the federal government, the local municipality or the county in 56 years. We are in this by ourselves and we are trying to survive. And one of the things that we did, Michaeline and I, was take that extra burden on to ourselves and create the Muncie Three Sisters Farm. Um, I don't know if that's the last one or not. Next slide. Yeah. So um, again, I just want to thank you for providing me with the opportunity, you know, to present this to to everyone. Um, it is truly a, a tragedy and travesty what's happened to my community who had fought on the side of the Americans, those rebels, right? So that this could be a place of freedom for all people. And we find ourselves today, you know, those uh, who haven't yet realized there are our civil rights. We find ourselves, you know, not realizing our environmental in, in, uh, justice and environmental racism, which we still fight every single day. The plan is to uh, push everything to the middle and put a cap on it and leave our people there. My plan, that's what their plan is. My plan is to grow uh, three acres of hemp here on our farm to create medicine, but also to create a, a, uh, a resource so that we can hold those people accountable um, to every extent of the law. So again, uh, Anishik for allowing me this time. Um, I'll be going on mute. Uh, I have to jump back on the other call, but I will be- Anishik, Wanishi, Chief Sakima. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, my honor. Thank you so much, Chief Mann, for that uh, historical and cultural overview and also speaking about the uh, environmental racism challenges your community is facing. Uh, for the next 25 minutes, we're going to be hearing from multiple speakers, I think mostly uh, recordings and videos. So we can get started with that. Hi. I'm Theo Bronskill. I'm an elder with the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware. My native name that was gifted to me is Three Winds. We are a matrilineal society. We introduce ourselves through our mother's lineage. That is the Lenape way. This means that we are descended from our mother's clan. We are who our mothers are. The Lenape way was that women were involved in the decision-making process for the greater good of the tribe. Women controlled the resources and economics. Land represents something very different to Native American people. In popular American culture, land is something that you can possess. You can conquer it. You purchase it, trade it, mine it, farm it. You can develop it. You can exploit it. Land is money. That is why it is called real estate. But in Native American culture, land is not a commodity. It is an intricate living part of Native culture. Land is not something that you can buy or conquer. It cannot belong to us. We belong to it. Land is that which bears life, that which nurtures life, that which protects life, and sometimes that which disciplines life. Very much like the female persuasion of all species. So because life itself and land itself have such feminine characteristics, women are the, are the ones that reserve the right to maintain it. Land and women are synonymous, two parts of the same entity. Land is our mother. 
and in most Native American languages, the word for lamb is the same word for mother or woman. So because women reserve the right to maintain land, this changes not only how we utilize land, but how we navigate through it. And it also changes how our families and communities are formed. In popular America, um, in popular American culture, when families are formed, traditionally the woman goes with the man. After they take their vows, what is the first thing that a woman does? She takes his surname and she becomes forever known as part of the man's clan. The man's clan recognizes her as part of the man's clan. Society at large recognizes her as part of the man's clan. But in Native American culture, it is often a different situation. When men and women come together to marry, traditionally, the man goes with the woman. Why does he go with her? Because she has the land. Because she is the land. Any children they will have are known as part of the woman's clan. Any girls will stay and inherit and maintain the land and the men will leave and go to the communities that they married into. So the women are always the constant factor, the unchanging part of community. I come from my mother. She comes from her mother and she comes from her mother and all we and all we come from our great grandmother we are the women of this land mother earth the Lin the land of the lenape peace my name is dominique london and i am currently sitting on the piece of land that was previously stewarded by my grandmother, Pauline London. And I am very grateful and have a lot of gratitude for being able to steward this land after her. I was able to save this land uh, a day before the city sheriff sale in Philadelphia. Land is important to me because not only does land provide, right, but that's such a capitalist way of thinking about everything, right? What is it that we're receiving from people and things? We all know that we get our food and our sustenance from the earth. But the thing that's most important to me is the lesson of Aini or sacred reciprocity. When we are in service to the earth, when we are tasked with replenishing the soil that we've destroyed or rebuilding habitats that we've torn down, it actually improves who you are as a human being. And so land is important to me because it teaches me that I am to be of service of, of others at all times for my own um, sustainability, for my own um, just health, mental health, spiritual health. And so that's why land is important to me. What this land means to me, to our Lenape people, our ancestors were here living and working this land many, many years ago. This land we grew up on, we played, we picked strawberries, we picked corn, beans, and on Saturday nights we made homemade strawberry ice cream. I remember one day when Mr. Ed Height was talking to us at one of our annual gatherings, and he said that this land belonged to the Hanser Durham family. That touched my heart so much because I am a descendant of the Hansers and the Durms. I thank God, our great spirit, every day for this land, and I hope one day it will be returned to us. Morning Spirit. Hi, my name is Trinity Norwood. I am a citizen of the Nanticoke Lenai Lenape Nation. Um, our ancestral lands are where we are right now in New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania and even the southern part of New York. As a Lenape person, this land is connected to my very existence. It's where my ancestors lived, loved, and died. Without this land, there'd be no Trinity. 
My ancestors lived off the gifts of this land and what it provided for them and thanked Mother Earth for her daily sacrifice so that we as a people could continue to survive. And this is a tradition we continue to practice today. Many of my tribal family members farm our traditional foods and medicines as well as practice traditional hunting and fishing tactics, continuing our strong bond with the land. As a woman, I'm connected to this land as a giver of life. And like a spoiled child, mankind has continued to take and take from its mother earth, not realizing or just simply ignoring the consequences of a one-sided relationship. As adults, we typically at some point in our lives embrace the fact that in time, we will have to pour back into our parents and take care of them. So it baffles me and breaks my heart that many people don't make that same connection to this land that we live on. This land grounds us, all of us, both physically and spiritually. It connects us. Being a part of a culture that constantly battles erasure, my understanding of the terrible concept of denial and society's lack of concern for environmental needs is particularly intimate. We have been on this earth for just a blip of its existence. How can we then ignore the needs when it is the very reason we're alive? Before the concept of time, this land was here. As man took its first steps, this land was here. As pyramids were built, dynasties rose and fell, this land was here. As settlers came to these American shores, this land greeted them. As my ancestors were murdered, displaced, and forced to hide, this land preserved them. If we do not protect the land, we are not protecting our mother. We're not protecting our source of life, which means we are not protecting ourselves or each other. Wanishi, thank you. Hi, my name is Wanda Durham Pardon, and I want to tell you what the land means to me. The land is our beginning. We need the land to provide for ourselves. We cannot do without the land. It is our own destiny to exist as a Lenape nation and the ability to manage our own affairs. The land is needed to complete us, the Lenape tribe of Delaware. We need to reclaim our land. Thank you. All of you out there who are listening and who are watching, as First Nation people, we often try to come in terms of what land means to us. Well, you know something? From my heart and from my most inner First Nation spirit, I have composed something for you. And I hope what I'm delivering will feed your soul. For Native people around the country, ancestral land hold meaning beyond ownership. Tribal communities see themselves as stewards. Their particular place in the living world is linked to identity, culture, and history. You see, we are the land that is the fundamental idea embedding in Native American life. The earth is the mind of the people as we are the mind of the earth. It's not just a mean of survival. A setting for our affairs. It is rather a part of our being. Dynamic, significant, real, it is ourself. You see, nature is something we live with in and is a part of it. Its spiritual values calls for reverence, respect, and humility in our relationship with nature. The first over all truth that we should love the land, see that it is beautiful, find delight in it, live in it, and respect it, and by showing our gratitude to the Creator who blessed us with it. My name is Paige Morning Glory McNabb, and this is my mom. Hi, I'm Bonita Laughing Heart McNabb. And we're going to be talking about what the land means to us as Native people. So one of the big things that I think 
land means to us is about spirituality. It's about our spirit and our connection. It's kind of, it's hard for me to explain, but some people just don't get it. Um, yeah, I think that the environment in all creation is God's glory manifested. But there's a song, and um, in, in the song it, it talks all about God's creation, how, how Christ uh, was there in the beginning, and um, he wanted us to be in heaven with him, which didn't happen, so he brought heaven down for us. Um, it's, it's a beautiful song. Um, um, so I think that the, like you said, I think it's all about spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's definitely hard to put into words, too, you know? Yeah. It feels very abstract. It's something that just like, it's something you feel more so than you can put into words. It's a feeling. Yes, so that's why it's hard to explain <laughs> to somebody. You have to feel it inside. In your heart, in your yes. soul. Yes, and, and his spirit is within us. If you look in the Bible, His spirit, he's already put his spirit within us. So you know that it's there. You know that it's right. So for me, um, if you're trying to have a right relationship with the creator, uh, if you're spiritually aware Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're searching for self-actualization, then you feel it, you know it. Um, I mean, our, our people had it there at the beginning. We didn't even have the Bible <laughs> and we were doing what we were supposed to, uh, right. stewardship. Um, Mother Earth has been placed here and she's providing us with everything that we need to survive. So we're called to be stewards. So something that we talked about earlier too was that as Native people, we kind of have a few different homes here. One of them is Hughes Crossing in Cheswell, named after our, our family. Yes, right across from us was the homestead, and then here where we're sitting was part of the Hughes Strawberry Patch, which was really <laughs> not a patch, it's a field. It's it was really... A, that was a pretty big patch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as it went, was handed down to son to son, um, Uncle Perry Hughes had his farm on that side of the road and then over here where we're sitting his brother our ancestor uh, Edward Hughes had his farm but they still collaborated and worked together mm -hmm. so it's all about land is all about stewardship we've been put here to take care of it it's not ours it's been given to us from the Creator to use for what we need but to help one another right and that's what our people did back then although they they farmed they still farmed enough not just to last for themselves and their families but in case somebody else in the community needed food right you have to look for the whole not just the individual right that's that's the way the, the native natives believe mm -hmm. it's all about the tribe not just self right you have to look at the bigger picture and i think that's what a lot of people that's that's one of the reasons why things aren't in balance now because people don't think that way mm -hmm. so it's a me myself and I sometimes world me myself and I world Definitely. so that's why things are out of balance right now it's not about owning the land you're not superior you are a part of the creation you're not superior to the creation you're part of it now, besides here in Chesla, what's one of our other homes? This is Millsboro. Oh, yes. Millsboro, where our, uh, our pal always every year. I, um, when I go down there, I really feel... You feel the spirit put right into you. When you enter that circle, yes. and enter the grounds, everything. You feel it really strongly down there. I feel like I'm in another world. I'm yes. so at peace. And that's where our Tillman, Ridgeway, and Cena Mosley actually raised some of their family before they moved up here. Um, so when I go to the powwow, when I go to Indian Mission, we used to go to the Indian Mission uh, homecomings all the time when I was growing up. And we would meet family there, just like at a powwow, we would meet family that we hadn't seen over the year. And we would um, go inside have church service and come outside and we would eat outside together that was yeah. so awesome you could see the women had the stoves all lined up against the church wall 
and then all the tables were set up over here. People came from Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and, and other places just to be together to see family again. Right. And we ate outside. So not only is the land, it's it's spiritual, it's also about the community and family and getting all together on yes. your land, on these yes. places that are significant. Yes, and that's why it's so important because it's, it's one person from one generation to the next. The next. And our God is a generational God. <laughs> It's, we were doing it before <laughs> before we were given the Bible. We were living yeah. the way we were, we were supposed to be living, the way we've been called. Any other thoughts? I was going to think about my our third home, too, which is up in Clayton in the woods. Yes. Now, up there, that's where I feel very at home and at peace in the woods. You know, being next to the trees and being in the land, being so close to it, it's... You feel the power from everything because everything has a spirit. Everything has its own energy and life to it. So being in there, it's refreshing. You can meditate back there. You feel really connected. To that that's that's why I'd, I'd always go back there into the woods for walks or to read books, just so I get that extra sense of peace and wholeness. In that connectedness, you connect yes. with the Creator. Yeah, and all of His creations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when Angela, my sister, was moving back to California in 2019, fall of 2019, I had my niece with me and I thought, oh no, she's just the perfect age for, <laughs> for us to start teaching yes. about the land and our ancestry and our culture. So we'll I have to pass it on. I was upset. Generation. Yes. And I didn't know this until last year. Angela told me that she saw when she was little. So I was probably about 11, she was probably about 5. She said from time to time she would see a tall, dark figure outside here. <laughs> she didn't tell me that till last year <laughs> when we were talking. So she said, who could it have been? So I said, it could be Uncle Perry because I remember Mom saying that he was tall. So I said, let me find a picture. So I sent her the picture and she said, oh my gosh, that's him. That's the man I saw. So we kind of had our little laugh, but um, mm -hmm. I told him, I said he was coming back to make sure that the, his strawberries were here, the ground's being taken care of the way it should be, mm -hmm. and um, he's checking up on us, our, our ancestors uh, making sure we're okay. Chief Mark always says all of my relatives, mm -hmm. because in the native way, everything is connected and we are a part of it. We're a part of the web of life. We're not superior right. to anything else. So that's why we're supposed to say all of my relations, all my relatives, the stones, trees, the fish, everything flying, everything in the rivers, the rivers themselves, because the rivers are the lifeblood, mm -hmm. the water, the rivers are the lifeblood of Mother Earth. Exactly. And so that's why we're all related and all connected. And But we are called to be the stewards of everything. Our lumber, our, our air, you know, our water. Those are things that, that we need. That, that Those are gifts. Those are not resources to be sold and packaged and then take those packages on to, to, to fill and sicken this earth. Um, we, we must do better. We must do better as a, as a people. Humanity must do better. If, if we listen to our indigenous family and if people just would slow down and, and, and go back and connect, connect with the original keepers of this land, our people, other indigenous communities. We were the original keepers of this land. And we know the lessons. The lessons were gifted to us so that we may sustain in this life. And that, so we must do better. We must do better and we must teach our young ones that, that these are the rules. These, these are the rules to live by and, um, and, and, and just and walk and live in this earth in, in a good way. So just, just to be respectful of all the blessings that Creator has afforded us. It has to be corrected or we won't have an earth. We have the earthquakes, we have the hurricanes, we have the tornadoes. The earth is crying back. She's showing us that I don't like this. 
I don't like this. You got you you know, you humanity, you must do better. And the strides we take aren't enough. They they aren't enough. Our Arctic is melting. Our polar bear soon won't have any place to live. That is so sad. That is so sad that we have depleted things and, and sickened things in a way that she's changing. Our earth is changing. The gift is changing. How will those behind us survive and, and, and be afforded the blessings that, that we all can appreciate or should appreciate? So we, we, must, we must do better. We must pay attention to these things. We must learn about it. We must um, push people to acknowledge it. And, um, and we must all get on board and all get on the same page. And if people aren't understanding, if they're not listening to you, uh, get involved. Every day, make a decision to do, to live in a better way for what's good for this land, what's good for your people, what's good for humanity. Again, if you don't know, get some resources. Read about it. Study it. Go to some some marches. Some, uh, you know, call your local legislatures and, and, and make a plea for, for changes. Every small change is a change. And, and let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do as a people. And um, my prayer is that everyone loves this land and, and appreciate, appreciates it as, as much as I do. And uh, with that, um, I will close out. Thank you for, uh, for listening. And, uh, and, and I appreciate um, your time. Thank you so much. Hey, when you Felicia, watch Nash Yakima Kanik Kubak Kanik, and Shak Shash the Nape Hoking Pa, Ku the Yakima Nation Pa. When I think about land and my relationship to it, I think about land as the source of life and the source of all creation. And I think about it not just as the earth beneath my feet, but as the entire ecosystem that humans are a small part of, and it's our responsibility to stay properly in balance with everything else that's happening around us. As a Yakima person from my homelands, I also know and understand how deeply indigenous identity is tied to the land. Our food comes from the land, our culture comes from the land, our ceremonies and our creation stories all come from the land. Our clothing, our art, our medicine, every way of life that we have is deeply connected to the ecosystem around us. So as we work to preserve the earth, we are also working to preserve ourselves and our life ways and our own cultures. Climate justice, therefore, is deeply entrenched in and tied to indigenous sovereignty and indigenous life ways because as we work to preserve and protect nature, we also are working to preserve and protect ourselves and our ways of being. Wow, that was that was amazing. Thank you so much to Priscilla Bell, Felicia Tater, and Kitty Hyde for putting that video together. And while uh, Victoria is refreshing the slideshow uh, just to incorporate some edits that were just recently incorporated into there, I just want to mention something really important that the first speaker uh, talked about, which is uh, women being the basis of the land and the basis of culture and indigenous society. And I want us to think about why in our society and also in Canada, um, there's this huge crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women. They're still being targeted because they were the basis of the land and the basis of the culture, and they're still being targeted today. That kind of clicked something for me that hadn't really clicked before. Um, and I hope we all meditate on that and think about what that means. You know, the patriarchy system that we're living in, that's not indigenous to this land. That's not, that's not native. So yes, we're gonna continue on in a few minutes with uh, indigenous 215. And as soon as we queue up the slideshow, we're going to get started. So whoever from Indigenous 215 is going to be doing this section, feel free to jump in whenever you're whenever you're ready. Um, thank you, Hahom, uh, Ron, very much. Mabrika um, Usaweu, greetings and good day. Um, the previous video, as Ron stated, um, was put together by Indigenous 215, but also we couldn't have done it without the other participators uh, that were so gracious enough to send us their videos. So, Hahom um, Wanishi, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, 
can see my, let me see. So um, today uh, representing Indigenous 215 uh, is myself, Priscilla Bell Lamberti, um, Taino Indigenous Caribbean, and uh, Felicia Tedder, Yakama. Uh, Indigenous 215 land present, past, present, and future mural arts land circle presentation. Next. So Native people are deeply tied to the land, so a lot of people have already touched on. Our tribal names usually translate to the people who live here or the people who live over there. Our cultures and cultural expression usually adapts and moves depending on our ecological boundaries and what's around us. And the land we are on influences our language, our food, our art forms, our shelters, our clothing, our tools, and literally every other aspect of our lives. Next. Native people are not a monolith. It's important to remember that no one person can speak for the entire nation of the people, or no group, one group, can talk for all intertribal nations of people. We are each unique people with unique views, ideas, and understandings, all from unique tribes, structures, and cultural ways. While there are many similarities between indigenous worldview, um, there is also a wealth of difference to be explored for our process, we wanted to include as many voices as possible. Next. So as you saw from that video, um, we just watched Native people are still here. We are still, we are literally live among you. Um, we are still defending our homelands. We are still living in our homelands. Um, and although many people have been displaced, um, people are fighting for their right to go home and their right to return, um, and also their right to be anywhere that they are. Um, so Native people are not just a historicized um, or like mythical thing. We are just literal people um, who are still fighting for our right to live and be free um, within the so-called United States. Next. Um, fellowship with the land, uh, the past. Previous uh, to colonization, indigenous people lived in relationship with the land, not as owners, but as coexisting human beings. Um, in the spirit of this philosophy, this two row wampum represents an agreement of non involvement between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch and was the basis of, for all treaties that followed. However, settlers did not share this relationship to the land and understood the land as a commodity to be owned. To gain ownership, European settlers have cheated, lied to, and murdered Native people across the globe in pursuit of the land that they occupy. Next. Fellowship with the land present. Instead of giving the land back, which is a great hashtag you should blog, look at. Um, colonial governmental structures aim to continue the systematic genocide of indigenous peoples and cultures through political and education means, even as they claim to seek to make amends for their pasts. They restrict the movement of indigenous people while destroying the landscape we have called home since time immemorial. Next. Um, yes, uh, so there's two pictures here, uh, one of the 2016 Standing Rock protests. Um, indigenous 215 grew out of the Philly for Standing Rock protests as indigenous organizers realize the best people to center us are ourselves. Um, the bottom photo is uh, the 2017 Philly People's Climate March. Um, the Philly People's Climate March was organized by a coalition of climate justice organizations, including Indigenous 215. And you can see the um, Native folks uh, were front and center and they were centered in this particular, um, in this particular march. Next. Um, in February 2000, Indigenous 215 and allies took action against Chase Bank in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en organizers defending their homelands against a natural gas pipeline. Um, this fourth photo actually is not Indigenous 215, but just something cool that my friends did recently um, in so-called Sacramento um, in a cool way to use art. They are taking a stand against Wells Fargo, which is a top target of the Stop Line 3 movement, and they actually made a mural um, in front of this Wells Fargo that took up the entire street. Um, and stop traffic for the day to do that. Next. 
Uh, fellowship with the land, um, what we can do in the future. Indigenous communities have the right uh, to decide what happens in their territories and to access and steward the land. Next. And a way to build um, toward Indigenous sovereignty and correct fellowship with the land um, is to build relationships with Indigenous people. As we've seen today, they are Indigenous people across Lenape Hoking who are already doing tons of work. Um, so supporting those and actually becoming re in relation with Indigenous people instead of like in a one-off um, kind of like, hey, we called you and that's cool. Um, also give resources when you have them. Um, a lot of folks, so giving land back is number five, but is, the, is like top, uh, just let us have a land back. But you can do that giving any resources that you do have um, to Indigenous people and reaching out and saying like, what do you need? I'm in your homeland, how can I help? Um, include Indigenous people and Lenape people in Lenape Hoking here um, from the beginning. Um, often Indigenous folks are brought on to like do a land acknowledgement or are very much like a second thought because colonialism has made us an afterthought um, in everyone's mind. Um, but, and so like to break that, including indigenous folks from the beginning in really intentional ways um, is necessary if folks are wanting to do social justice work um, or wanting to even outside of like social justice or just wanting to create right relations um, with the people and with the land that you're on and the place that you're in. Um, honoring indigenous sovereignty, um, which goes back to the right to move, the right to be, the right to uh, be the initial stewards of the land and have that recognized um, is extremely important. Like I said, giving the land back in a really literal way. People think that this is, it seems very upfront, but um, people think that it's not, but it's like literally if you are on land and you have the ability to give that back to people, which you do if you're on it, um, give that land back to the stewards who know how to take care of it, who will ensure that it lasts because they have been ensuring that it lasts from time memorial. Um, and educate yourself throughout. A lot of people have already said that, um, but continuing to educate, continuing to learn. Even through this video, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Um, I learned something new about this land every time that I sit with a Lenape person um, and have the opportunity to learn from them. Um, and so continuing to do that education, continuing to build those relationships so that you can be in a better relationship with the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. Um, thank you so much for letting us present here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Priscilla and Felicia for that great presentation. Um, now we're gonna hear from Chirito Morales. Mabrica. Mabrica. Taino T. Charito, daughter of one of the biggest chiefs in the island of Puerto Rico, is Bojataka, my great great grand grandfather, one of the biggest warriors that has actually fought against Christopher Columbus. And the people who are fighting and still fighting until today, because we are the, old, the oldest colony in the whole entire world, we, we are being withheld by Americans and abuse. So why I'm here today in the land circle, we want to talk about why we got to continue as an indigenous fighting, fighting every day for our piece of land, our ancestors. And I'm really happy to see all your beautiful faces today, all our brothers and sisters, our descendants of the Lenape, Mayas, Incan, uh, all of them in, in, in this you know, part of the Philadelphia area, which is a sacred land of the Lenape every day, like my coworkers and my sister Anna Kakuyani just mentioned before, this is our land and we're gonna continue fighting for, uh, for the use of our lands and our climate uh, change and justice. Um, next slide. I'm not native from here, but this is our, uh, the Tainos. Uh, that flower was uh, our Atabey, provided to us and that is what identify the people meanings um that's the blood but at the same time the air will blow all the taino signs that's our beautiful language and it means powerful as a taina indigenous woman next slide why i'm bringing this to you guys because we want to collaborate we want to continue fighting for our land 
for this beautiful sacred land, not only this one, throughout the whole nation, throughout the whole world, because we are not dead. We are pretty much alive and our ancestors fought for us. And this is basically our living in the area of Philadelphia, how we can use us and build in our capacity, a better living, a quality of life, using our land and provide to our children and our next generation to come. Next slide. Here we, I'm using the land of the Lenape land. We all did respect and we planting the trees. We giving life, we've improving the quality of air. We are providing, using the land as my sister mentioned before, we are providing, this is our source. This is the source of our medicine. We have to create power and we have to create it by just using the land. And as you can see, we are planting trees because it's a lot of trash, it's a lot of dirt, it's a lot of issues with the quality of the air, it's a lot of issues with the, our waters, how we can improve, right? So we're working together and collaborating each other with everybody here in the city of Philadelphia. Next. As you can see, it's a lot of places we take out the trash. And instead of trash and empty spaces, we are planting trees for beautification projects to climate change, to improve the quality. And you know, using our piece of land is, is a blessing for us. Next slide. No one is illegal. This is our land. Nobody is illegal in the modern land, in the modern nature. Everybody belongs here and we're gonna keep fighting. We're gonna keep putting our voices out there as a Taino woman, as a Lenape woman, as a Navajo woman, as a Cherokee woman, as a Mayan, as an Incan woman. We all have to stand up. We have to rise up and we have to tell them, this is our land. Nobody's illegal. Everybody's welcome. It's another thing that I want to mention. Christopher Columbus, when he stopped, he's a genocide in the island of Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean, Dominican Republic. He says, Taino, Taino is our, <laughs> he, he didn't make no sense when he said that's the name of a tribe. Taino means humble, welcome. And this is who we are. We are all indigenous. We welcome everybody. And we are really humble. And we appreciate modern land. Next. This is our pray, our find and ways to say thank you, everybody. We gotta keep rising. We gotta keep telling people that we are not dead. We was never dead. We was never dead. Our mitochondria means my, my, our mother, our ancestor, make sure that we was assisting and they reproduce us and we keep, we keep reproducing us each other. As a, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. And in the future, I'm gonna have great, great grandkids and they are pretty much raising here in the Lenape land. But we also, with all the respect, wanna say thank you to the Lenapes to welcome us as a Tainos indigenous and live in this beautiful land. Next. As you can see the devastation, the colonizers are still doing devastation in our beautiful land of Puerto Rico. We are being oppressed by the government. They taking our lands away from us. They taking our food sources. They taking our, our ecology and our economy and they using it against us. Everything is being privatized and we keep fighting every day from here, from the diaspora, from all over the globe. And we wanna keep standing up and I want people to hear us. We have to stop this abuse, ecological abuse in the island of Puerto Rico as a Taino woman. Next. As you can see, that's the, that is, I am the, he's my ancestor. The picture that you're seeing in here is in the big rock and the entrance of my tribe, which the person that you see right there is the chief Oaxaca. Oaxaca, it was the person who wounded the people who entered in the island of Puerto Rico with Christopher Columbus. He was killed, he was dead, uh, they killed him, he was burned out, and he was fed to pieces to the people, indigenous people, to prove that the people with Christopher Columbus, with the Spaniard crown, they have the power of the island and they took all my family and they killed them. They sacrificed my family until these days we are being colonized by this call, 
white American or white or um, Spaniards is that we are the longest colony, but that there is our sacred land of the island of Puerto Rico. Next. Thank you. Mabrika, everybody, and how home for having me here. Thank you so much, Trito. That was so interesting um, to hear about the indigenous struggle from Puerto Rico and what's happening here in Philly. Um, so right now we're gonna have, uh, I guess we're gonna do a breakout session where we're gonna do general questions and answers. Um, so the first question we have is uh, what most resonated with you about the stories? And the second question is how do these stories of the land relate to your own climate justice issue? So in the breakout room, uh, this is what we wanna think about. And we have 15 minutes for this. So that means we're gonna be back at 4.05. And I'm guessing that we're gonna be sorted into different breakout rooms. So we'll be back in 15 minutes. Presentations, uh, we're gonna hear from Gabriela Paez. Um, take it away. Hey everyone, I've been so inspired by everything I've heard today. So again, let's get started. And I'll talk today about loving, restoring and protecting our urban forest and how to mobilize communities to combat climate change. Next. So this is me. I was born in the Dominican Republic who have lived in Philadelphia for the last 15 years. So I've lived half of my uh, life over there, half here. I went to school at Esperanza Academy located in Hunting Park in North Philadelphia. Um, then went to college, you know, went to Eastern for biology um, and then got my master's at, at Penn. Um, and this is a picture from one of my trips to the DR because growing up, um, I always loved nature. I, I remember waiting for summer breaks just to go to the countryside because I was born in San Pedro, which is a city. So I will spend my entire summer break, my entire Christmas break, and if I could, I, could, I will have lived there just to have that contact with nature uh, and everything that it meant. Yeah. Uh, being able to see the skies. And to me, that was very significant growing up. And when I came back, I noticed and witnessed the destruction of many of the areas I once visited in the DR. And it broke my heart that there were no protections there to reserve those places. So it is still a beautiful country, but I can see what, um, you know, what the disinvestment can cause and when we are not protecting our earth. So yeah, next. So again, um, for the last seven years, I've been able to serve the community that welcomed me to the United States when I moved here, when I was just, uh, just 15 years old. Um, and that's a community of Hunting Park. Um, and it's a thriving community. I just love people there and working with them. But sadly, this community has suffered from this investment and a lot of historical practices such as red li uh, lining that Ron just mentioned before. Um, and because of that, Hunting Park is full of different things. First, Hunting Park back in 2012 only had a 3.9% uh, canopy coverage. And here I'm talking about a subset of Hunting Park for this uh, st um, statistic specifically. Um, if you walk down, up and down Hunting Park, most houses do not have a yard, front or rear yard, because when these communities were designed, they were not thinking about the health of the community. They were not thinking about the need for trees. So again, that has brought a lot of problems. For example, today Hunting Park is one of the hottest temperature-wise uh, neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia. It could be up to 22 degrees hotter in the summer in Hunting Park than, than some other places of the city. Imagine this, you're somewhere and it feels like, like it is 70 degrees and you go to Hunting Park and it feels like it's 90 because of the surfaces, because of the lack of uh, canopy coverage, um, contamination from industry. So there's so many things there. So our community has been suffering from different things like asthma. So I loved uh, the expression of one of the videos that the earth is a health system. So what I try to do is to bring environmental justice back to the places that have been disinvested. Uh, specifically, again, I've been working with Hunting Park. And now with the city of Philadelphia as part of uh, PHS3 tenders in the advisory committee. And we're also working now on an urban forestry plan, forestry plan. And I'm part of the community voices. And it's an honor for me to do this. And just learning today about the Lenape and the fact that this is, you know, like the history of this land just inspires me more to do this work with much more respect and dedication. So next. So 
the work that I've done in the last, again, almost seven years, they call me the tree lady. So I've done a lot of work to, again, increase canopy coverage in Hunting Park and break some barriers to access. For example, Hunting Park is, is over 60% Hispanic. Programs were only in English. So how are our, our residents going to understand? So I've been advocating for these things to also be done in a bilingual way. So whatever resources are offered in English and Spanish. And with Tree Philly, which is the, the city agency that, that deals with trees, um, we were able to give away uh, over a thousand trees so far to the community and surrounding areas. But these are yard trees. And remember, I told you that a lot of these homes do not have a yard. So if we're only giving away yard trees, then we are missing out on you know really serving the community. Next. And that's how this partnership with PHS was born. And the first ever bilingual tree tenders training was born. So PHS has been, done, has been doing great work for the past like 30 years, but this training until 2018 was only a English, you know, English training. So now the training serves many other communities around Philadelphia. I know Charito has done a lot of work as well with, with PHS. And we have planted over 100 trees in the community of Hunting Park only um, to this program. And that's, that is uh, sidewalk trees, apart from the yard trees, which is very um, significant. Next. This is a picture from um, the training that we hosted, the first bilingual training at Esperanza. You can see that, the, that there's people here from multiple races, uh, multiple ages, the youngest, um, kid was like 11 years old and the oldest, I'm pretty sure she's like 72 <laughs> now. So you can see uh, that everyone, you know, had the, co the, the, the common ground of caring for the land. And, and sometimes, you know, we're not reaching out to the community so they can become part of the changes that need to happen. So yeah, this is a picture and next. So I want you to see uh, what this has meant for communities um, in Hunting Park. My work has been level, um, black level. So I am really interested in walking out there and speaking with residents, um, you know, to engage them uh, in the change in their own blocks. And something that I always say and that we, you know, um, say in this work, and I've been doing this work with Esperanza for, again, those last years, is neighbors owning change. So it's not about going into communities to transform them. It is not going in there to help them. It's just listening to them and offering the resources that they say they need to actually uh, provoke this change. So this is Cayuga Street in 2014. This is Carolina, I love her. Um, she's been in the community for like 30 years. It has been very, very involved. So this is a cleanup um, on her block in 2014, next. This is 2016. We actually also at Esperanza um, have a program to give um, materials to blocks to beautify the rocks. It can be planters, paint, whatever they believe will improve their blocks. So that was this project in 2016. Next. This was the first block to receive trees. And as you can see, there's multiple on both sides. So again, I tried to tackle like whole blocks as much as possible and knock on doors and educate residents about the importance of trees. The fact that we plant the right tree in the right spot because we know that a lot of trees have caused damage um, because they didn't think about that stuff back like 30 years ago, but now we're planting the right trees in the right spot. So, you know, it's that interaction and that education experience. So we can actually do this um, in a block, but are you ready for this? So this is 2018. Let's go to the next slide. Ta -ta! This is Cayuga in 2019. So the trees are happy, they're flowering. Now you have flags, you have planters. I mean, you look up and down this block and you feel like you're somewhere else in the neighborhood. And this is exactly what we can do. And, and my, 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 like my vision is like 20 years from now, even if I'm not like, you know, necessarily working in this specific neighborhood, but for this to be every block in Hunting Park and hopefully every block in Philly. So that's why I've been so invested in this work because this is possible. When we engage our residents and we allow them to own the change, things like this can happen all over the place. 
So that is my vision and my goal, and I hope that happens. Next. So from all of this, the first ever heat resiliency plan in Philadelphia was born, Beat the Heat Hunting Park, that engaged a bunch of stakeholders, almost every organization in Hunting Park, the city of Philadelphia, public health, everyone that you can think of that, you know, who come together to make this happen came together. Um, and not only for Hunting Park, but for also to benefit other communities in Philadelphia that are now suffering from the issues of high heat um, in their uh, neighborhoods. And you can actually look it up. I will paste the link here later. Next, and just some lear learning experiences that I've had, let me hide, hide everyone. Um, first, to serve a community, uh, we need to understand the community that we, we want to engage and serve and what are the limitations? What are the barriers to remove? Um, in my case, it was making sure that everything was also done in Spanish. Uh, let's not underestimate black level engagement and mobilization. Start small and it will get big. Identify existing resources and build partnerships with the city uh, and everyone else that can help. Be patient and act as a resource to the community and allow neighbors to own the change and make sure education is at the heart of what you do. So this is my 10 minute presentation, um, quick presentation, just so you can see a little bit of what's happening in Philadelphia um in the work with increasing kind of the coverage and hopefully returning health to our communities thank you wow thanks so much gabriella it was really inspiring to see again um how you transform these neighborhoods in hunting park uh next we're going to hear from iglesias garden uh they had an event today so they sent us a sound recording so let's take a listen go ahead all right so hey my name is anthony and I am with Lauren. Yes, and we are from the Inglacius Gardens, you know, located on Lawrence and North Streets in North Philadelphia. And just want to acknowledge that the land is traditionally of the Lenape people where the garden sits. Mm hmm. Important. Good. Mm hmm. All right. Located on Lenape land, the garden was started in 2012 by members of Philly Socialists. You know, and today we are a group of activists and neighbors who fight for community control in our land and neighborhood. You know, we grow our own food, we grow medicine, you know, we gather together and we honor the land. Um, a little bit further back in the past before 2012 you know because i i live up the block my parents always lived up the block um at lawrence and diamond but i remember when the land was just always being dumped on by developers and whatnot you know they tried to take the shortcut and just dump trash all on it and whatnot so it's funny that um years later they really interested in purchasing back the land and swooping out, taking everything out from under us. So it's like, damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and together, you know, we fight for the garden land as well as like neighbors' personal lots and gardens, you know, to keep an open green space in our neighborhood for as long as we can and, you know, stop destructive development. Like, I am a part of the community growing up there, so, you know, I know a lot of, outside of the people, you know, like Lauren, um, that I work with and whatnot, but, like, the people in this picture, yeah, I know them. Um, Miss Sarah's, she got a garden, you know, up the block. We used to, as a kid, I used to go back, go past all the time. She used to be watering her plants and stuff. Like she never owned it. Now she she has an opportunity to own it. You know, it could be in her name. She can take care of it. And it's like that all throughout the place. So the garden was started um, in originally by a, a group of organizers from Philly Socialists. Philly Socialist um, has a bunch of different projects that work all over the city, like a tenants union, uh, free ESL classes, 
um, um, like labor organizing Mm -hmm. and unemployed council, um, doing different um, kind of socialist organizing projects. And um, so we definitely come to this space with like this eco-socialist perspective where we're fighting the capitalist structures um, that are causing, you know, the displacement and gentrification and destruction of land, um, you know, fighting against the private real estate market and how affordable housing is like pitted against community gardens. Um, and the affordable housing that's being built is not even affordable um, to the neighborhoods where it's being built. And um, yeah, we also do uh, different mutual aid projects at the garden. Mm. You know. Yeah, that's that's what um that picture is. We just we out there. That's when we had that good ass sign. That sign was good. Know, Where is good that? Sign. We gotta find that sign. Yeah, <laughs> we do. But yeah, we do free food giveaways on Saturdays and like toy drives on holidays and just uh, you know, generally take care of each other. As best as we can. As best as we can. Right. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fighting this slide is about fighting injustices, and some of the injustices that's happening, and you know, not just that area because it's not just limited to that area. It's it's happening, you know, all over the United States. Um, but we got some redlining going on, a lot of it actually. We got structural racism and disenfranchisement capitalism of course you know and the people who use capitalism as an affront to like privatize housing and real estate which is some crazy stuff and it's just like really so um i mean yeah looking at that redlining map i saw gabriella also has this um heat map in her slide, um, and it's of Hunting Park, which is just, you know, not exactly where the garden is, but basically, you know, it lines up with redlining maps all over the city, um, Mm -hmm. where there, you know, it's, it can be 22 degrees hotter in some neighborhoods than others in black and brown and low-income neighborhoods compared to Rittenhouse, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. the community gardens and green spaces are important, not just for, like, bringing community together and being able to take care of each other, but it has a real effect on um, lowering um, temperature in the summer, retaining stormwater, uh, creating healthy ecosystems, keeping out trash, and, and providing better air quality and quality of life. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I, like... These two pictures are like milestones, like huge milestones. Um, like, you know, when they occurred, it was just like, damn, we, we really out here fighting, fighting the, you know, the system. We we standing up, mm-hmm. and like it's that big yellow knot for sale in the middle. Of the sh- that was that's bold as fuck, mm-hmm. like straight up. And and these, you know, yeah, okay. These pictures were from the same day. Yeah, same day. Yeah, this was um, the killer bill. We had we well, all right. Here's a little backstory, right? Um, and this is where we want name drop just a little bit. So, you know, in our district, we have council member Maria Quinona Sanchez, and she proposed a bill to have development occur at American and Burke's, um, which was an old junkyard. Um, We know what junkyards do to, you know, neighborhoods that they're around, um, air quality, um, things like that. We we know that. But um, the junkyard was shut down. They were proposing to do this high rise, 17 stories. Um, We caught wind of it and we started organizing, getting, you know, the word out, getting petitions signed, you know, mm-hmm. getting signatures. We sent it in. So we still 
like had the contingency plan of having a rally on a Saturday called Kill the Bill, plan on having people speaking out um, and whatnot against, you know, the stuff that's going on in the neighborhood. Two days before um, it was set to go down on Saturday, it was Thursday. I think it was, we had concluded like a little work day in the garden where we cleaned up a little bit mm-hmm. and whatnot. So we were all sitting around by the fire and I think we got a call that said the bill was actually, you know, tabled mm-hmm. and they, they, they halted it. So we had a, you know, a little celebration and it, it turned from being like a rally, you know, to just one big giant celebration. That's why you see the pictures. We got Fletcher Street coming through with the horses, giving the kids horse like horse rides and stuff like that. We have um we have a comrade of ours up here in the top right that's, you know, speaking out, giving a testimony. Um we have the dancers, Cesar's dancers coming through, you know, they they were Blessing the land. Blessing the land. It it was a sh- we were showing out that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that um development project would have been that seventeen story building as well as like fifty um the bill was to change the zoning from like three stories to five stories. So they could have built like fifty five story condos in this neighborhood of two story old row homes. Jesus. And some of the lots on the list were part of the garden, some of them were our neighbors' side lots and this is also a neighborhood where the new development um, has, like, cracked people's foundations. Um, mm-hmm. Just, you know, really destroyed their homes. So we stopped that. Yeah, so um, there's a couple, a couple members and neighbors of the garden that are Mexican immigrants and... Um, indigenous and bring this kind of like Aztec cultural history to the garden and you know Cesar Viveros who has um, painted murals for mural arts before and he has a bunch of sculptures at the garden and it's also really just become a place to like kind of share culture and um, like honor the land and make art together Um, all right. Well, thanks for listening to our story. Sorry we couldn't be here today in person over the internet, but, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, follow us on social media, check out our website, Mm glaciesgardens.com, come out on a Saturday. Yes. And affordable housing is a myth. Stop this land grab. This is, you know, we, we have so much beauty. Come Mm -hmm. check us out on Mm -hmm. Saturdays. We want actual affordable housing and community controlled land yes okay that was great that was iglesias garden sound recording and next last but not least we have alkibalan who is going to give us a 10 minute presentation and uh victoria one question can we change the uh the last breakout session from 15 minutes to five minutes because we're just a little bit over time uh, thank you all right can everybody hear me yep we can hear you Hi, everybody. My name is Aki Balan. Um, <clears throat> currently, I work with the Philadelphia Orchard Project. Um, but I guess, you know, I just want to start off by saying my role to climate justice came through Black liberation. You know, I am a 12th generation of enslaved human beings on stolen land. Um, you know, my story and perspective on how, I, how to get people to return and interact with Bill and the land. So essentially, right here, you see this, my picture of Freddie Gray. Or when I was at a protest with Freddie Gray. Um, essentially after that, that picture, I was arrested. They tried to give me four years and I felt powerless, like very powerless. You know, I felt like cattle and livestock, hopeless, strip search, um, separated from my, my family, my son, um, going to have to fight my trial, fight my trial at least four times. Um, they're trying to give me four years. My son is five now. So that means I wouldn't have seen him until he was four, man. Like that, that was hard and going through protests and things like that. And then going home. You know, I'm protesting police, um, but I'm going to work at the same time and me paying taxes support them so that didn't sit right with me. 
Um, so I had to think about most of my time and where I was going to put that energy. You know, I'm working 40 hours a week, but why? I had to start seeking solutions. Why do I work? And that's essential for the essentials to live, food, water, and shelter. Um, and it was a combination of desires to protect love, not live in fear to be free, you know, be around my family every second that I want it, cultivating our spirits and our conversation and care. And to not be under the weight of black skin, you know, black and brown skin has a certain price. You don't choose that when you come into this reality, but you have to deal with it. Um, next slide. So essentially, you know, I lost my job at that time. And I went through my agricultural boot camp. I went through Mill Creek Urban Farm, Greensboro, and Philadelphia Orchard Project. And I want to state for the record, you know, being that I am from an urban environment, um, pretty much, you know, by my neighbor interested in this. And the fact that I got in here is because of my connection to my access of the privilege that I have. Um, so essentially, food was the easiest thing at the time to acquire independence and power, you know? If I don't, if I can grow tits on the food, then I don't have to go to work that much. If I can produce more water, I don't have to do that either. Um, you know, so again, blacks and agriculture, you know, we were brought here to work another group soil. Like, I mean, another group built this continent and they brought us here to work it because, you know, we, we heard the stories earlier on, but I feel like that's, you know, we, we grew everything. Um, we have a very complicated relationship with land. Like I'm telling you, um, you know, next slide. So this is Mill Creek, and this is where I ran from 2017 to 2019, three seasons strong. And the reason why I say we have a very complicated relationship with land is think about it. We farmed the, we farmed the soil, we was used, we was bastardized for our gifts. We had to run from the south up to here to get away. And now we got kids who don't even want to step on my farm without covers, footy that you wear in hospitals onto the farm. They walk on Philly streets, they walk through landfills essentially, and they don't want to walk on soil they don't understand the difference between dirt there's real drastic disconnect i've seen people scared of grass but essentially this is the production farm in the middle of the city on 49th and brown it has a cob structure um two plum trees two cherry trees apples peaches and pears blackberries raspberries and strawberries two fig trees we had like three beehives sensory garden and asparagus patch and there was a lot you could pack onto this um and I just wanted to show people that you can really grow a lot of food here. Um, next slide. Um, and also like during this time of my cultivation, I had to cultivate my backyard. So this is my backyard. Being that I'm in an urban environment, we don't have really money to buy land. And it's all about cultivating the land that we are covering constantly. You gotta rebuild the soil um, and add layers of skin back to the earth because we're losing it. Um, next slide, you know, um, again, teaching others what's around us to give you an edge. How do you build cooperation? So this was some of the things we wanted to teach from the farm. We wanted to teach them the seasons, the functionalities and the transformations of everything from beginning to end. You know, most of these kids are taught as a model land is in forests, farms, and parks. But again, we need to focus on the land beneath us and then to the side of us. Um, you know, we, we, we're so traumatized and essentially that we want to separate ourselves from nature or land. Um, while I was on that farm, I seen a circular world that couldn't be seen or heard. Western life is ruled under God. You know, it's like, you know, <clears throat> the holy patriarch, essentially, you know, um, actual life is ruled underneath the goddess. The goddess represents transformation. Femininity represents transformation. Again, you break the soil in, in the spring, and you covered in the fall, but the whole time you're drawing our energy and adding it back. It reminds men of childbirth. You know, we talk about patriarchy a lot, and that's some of the things I instill to young men. The way you take care of plants is the way you take care of your woman. And the way you take care of the soil is how you take care of the womb. You put seeds in darkness and it goes to light. That may remind you of childbirth. And these are some of the things that the, the lessons, the stories that like I had access to, but I wanted to give to others. Um, uh, next slide. You know, essentially, I was a beacon on this land. When I was there, the farm was a center of activity, or that's what I wanted it to be. Um, I thought about how to show people the magic I was experiencing. The, solu the solution I thought of 
but the climate I was introduced to, the divine laws I relearned. The savior won't come from, the savior won't come from above, but it definitely will come from below. You know, we live in a world where like essentially groups for help were made to hold up this pyramid. And we have to let the pyramid go. You have to let it drop. But here we have kids from the community who wanted to go to a corner store, but I also told them to come back to eat. Because essentially when you plant trees, you have guaranteed food if you take care of them. We had fruit trees that hung over the fence um, of the farm and everything that hung over the fence, the community picked. And kids, when they would come by and pick them when they're green, you, know, you teach them the seasons, you teach them the lessons, you engage them. I stopped working, I ran down there and I got them. I was like, yo, you come back when those jones are brown, orange, or purple, or red. These things are going to transition. Um, you know, like I said, I found it interesting that we would explore it for that gift. But now it will save us. The soul reflects the life around you. The tunnel vision of the ills people face while on the land leave them in the days. Education breeds ignorance and reinforces it. So soil, climate is beneath them, essentially, because everything else is above them. So what is going to be beneath them? They've already been put next to animals. It's the only thing beneath the African. Mental imperialism has polluted the minds of the inhabitants of the land and has created a mental landfill. The dynamics of the slave economy still live today, even in our own communities and within ourselves. Um, I guess next slide. Um, here we just have more groups because part of the farm education was to teach kids, quote unquote, natural agriculture. Um, but it really, for me, just to help them remember that this is not a foreign concept. Um, we use popular education. Um, we did that farmer's market, I'm going to touch on that. But essentially through popular education, it was all about work days and sports. And also just getting kids to come back and build relations. When those gates was open, that's when I was there. Um, next slide. So again, this was our farmer's market that we did. So everything we produced in that farm, I mean, I grew thousands of pounds of food. Everything I mentioned before was just perennials. I grew like four varieties of tomatoes, spinach, kale, collards, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beets, carrots, arugula, grew all different types of herbs. You know, just to really, because it's all about imagery for my people at this point. The flashy trinkets and the bling bling. You know what I'm saying? These are the things that are going to catch people's eyes because they don't want to go back. They don't want to go backwards. So essentially, by building my soil, I was able to present produce that looked amazing. You know, you want a thing that'd be like, yo, like, you know, I wanted to, I want them to see magic, you know? So again, we have kids who was helping set up the market. We have youth on the right um, who was up running the market. It was part of like the, the quote unquote farm brigade. Um, but we have markets every Wednesday, 12 to 4 at 52nd and Habitat, and every Saturday at the farm 11 to 2. We took many forms of access to payment, but sometimes you didn't even ask for payments on Saturday. Again, we try to get off of capitalistic systems, right? So the way I would engage people would be like, yo, you put in a few hours to help cultivate the food, you can go home with it. And every hour you put in, I'll give you a few pounds. And it really was just me just giving food away. It isn't about people eating less than about the money. I sold a pound of organic kale for a dollar twenty-five. I only went up a quarter because my community advised me to. They like, you don't want to give things away for too free, but no, uh, it was all supply money for me to grow for more food. So it's all about teaching the communities to form loops and teaching these kids to form loops while they're on the land. Um, and then essentially from forth, from forth, from there, once you get kids to engage in food, then they will start paying attention to things that I discovered, plastic, um, just bad water, uh, air pollution, essentially. The fact that on my farm, it was cooler than it was on the sidewalk. You know, we talked about heat island a few minutes ago. Um, and also just plant and being able to have access to fresh air and clean air and clean water. Um, and this is all influenced through the land, because remember, land is the center point of that activity. Uh, next slide. Again, we had kids from Ape and Pop, uh, Martha Washington, um, kids from a local school. Um, and essentially, like, <clears throat> you know, we had them come out again, they're turning the soil, but we had to start teaching them, like, you know, you don't want to step on soil, you don't want to do compaction. Um, you have to teach them different properties of the soil, add the compost. Um, and they enjoyed their time out there, you know. Most of the kids, once you get them interested, they will. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was fun. I tried to create mazes out there for the kids, between the blackberries and the trees, you know. I, I arched them in a way, and I pruned them in such a way you created a tunnel. So when kids came on from the hot uh, rec centers that was located adjacent down the blocks, 
they would come to my farm. I would get them cool. And I'm like, yo, run through the shade, man. Go hang out. I would hang hammocks up and everything. Um, anyway, next slide. So again, this is the produce and most of the produce that we grew here. We took FM and PCHEX. Um, we took the Farmark, yeah, the Farm Market Nutrition Program with the senior food vouchers. We took WIC, EBT, and the program was designed, again, to buy more food. So every $5 you spent the benefits, you got $2 back, you know, in food vouchers, you know. Um, and I, I will sell out in two hours, you know, two hours. Like, I didn't have a lot of food, but I grew a lot in that space. Um, and also just people seeing me, like seeing a hero or something, you know, a black farmer, it was like a hero, you know. Um, next slide. Um, again, we was also selling wholesale. This is just to show the bounties of what I was able to do. We also had rhubarb too. I forgot all about that rhubarb. Um, but it's just to show like the, the amount of food you can produce in a very, very small space. Um, and that, that wasn't even like, that, that was just the beginning. Cause I was also reading stories about how the native populations here could go here. And it was amazing hearing these things. So it also just started influencing me. I can grow all, all right, next slide, next slide, next slide, let's keep going. Uh, we had did some few events, um, the Welcome Back Barbecue and Autumn Vibes. We cooked for 30 people twice on Autumn Vibes. Um, we cooked everything from the field and put it over a fire pit and we brought the people together so you can eat and harvest food. We had people harvest. This was before COVID, but we had people harvest and everything like that and become more engaged. Um, next slide. Um, these are two youth and Mama Justina. These are very important characters to me. These two youth came with me every day. They would show up because they knew I was there. They was trying to get away from trouble. Mama Justina came out because he's an elder, but it also shows the integrational context of how land can encompass memories, love, and uh, lineage, you know, um, and history. Next slide. Uh, this was a board, but I felt happy because Kofi was my first black man that I ever really worked with, and he grew those carrots, you know. I was able to help a man who was seeking it and gave him instruction, you know. And I was just in this myself. I've been in this since 2016, but I felt that was a milestone for myself. But this is just to prove Mill Creek board and things like that. People are brought on. Next slide. And this is the reason why I do everything I do. He is the future. He is my future. You know, masculinity needs a new place and it needs a new home. It has a place on the land and we just need to remember it. But, uh, you know, he was with me every second of the way. Um, next slide. Um, again, you know, we talk about as above, so below, you know, the fire in the sky is the fire in the soil. And when I stood on that farm, this is what I saw. Um, but also I wanna go into imagery and why you need to see more black people and also native and indigenous people. Because I think about that when it comes to perennial food systems and real food security. Annual vegetables are cute, but perennial systems are better. It's food security. So why don't you, why don't Blacks and Africans get together with Native folks to share knowledge and recover the skills that we have to cultivate food and really withdraw from the structure? We cook our own food, grow our own food, build our soil. We don't got to go to markets. We don't got to do anything. This is the point of like, if we were at war and we are prisoners of war and we have to remind ourselves of this. And we'll get our power. Um, next is just uh, next slide. It's really just a video of you know. I guess you can watch it, but it's some of the things that subconsciously inspired me as a kid. I call myself the man with the green hands because of this, and that will be it for my presentation after this video. Thank you. It's twelve thirty-seven in the a.m. and you're listening to Rod Simmons on Talk Radio. Our show tonight: The Flying Man of D.C. Does he really exist? Is he real or fiction? We want to hear from you. We want to hear your calls. Call in now. You know our number. Hey, Rod, man. I just want to say that, you know, with all the black on black crime in DC, it's uh, kind of nice to know a brother's out there trying to do something. Thanks. I just want to say, I don't know if he's real or not, but I've got two kids, and I just pray that he is. I think this is a ridiculous scam being perpetrated on the inner city by ambitious politicians stepping on the backs of my people for their own corrupt political agendas. Peace. You listen to Rob Simmons, a yes caller. 
All I know is that somehow someone they call the Flying Man closed down a crack house and it brought my son home. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a miracle. An outdoor grocery store. A garden in the middle of the ghetto. Ooh. It'll be thousands and thousands. Who is behind this? A few nights ago, we reported that the caped man was Clarence James Carter III. But the Bloods and the Crips say that it isn't Mr. Carter. Our caped hero wants to be called Meteor Man. No one knows his true yeah, so that's identity. Essentially it. Well, whoever that's you essentially are, it. keep up the good work. And Meteor Man, if you're ever in my neighborhood, lunch is on me. I'm Janice Farrell, reporting for Channel 3 News. Sorry. It's 1237 in the... Yeah, so that was it. That, that's kind of some of the things that I try to imagine for young brothers. When, I, when we want justice and things like that, we should go out and plant things up. And then they grow these systems, so essentially it will pop up overnight, quote-unquote, over time. Um, and things will be there. So, thank you guys. All right. Th thanks, all keep it on. That was, that was really inspiring. You know, I like that video. Um, we're going to skip the breakout room because we can discuss things amongst ourselves if we want, uh, personally. And we have a strategy circle update. So, I'm going to ask people just to stick around for about 10 more minutes because we have some really important updates on the whole entire project that we want to share with you. Um, so, whoever is going to start us off on that, please uh, jump in right now. Strategy circle updates. I think we need the, the um, slideshow. It would just oh, yeah. be follow through the slides. Hi. Um, so thank you for all those presentations. They were really amazing. Um, and also, I just wanted to update you guys that we have a website. I don't know if you guys have been able to see it, but if you follow, give me a second to find the link. If you follow that link, it should, that has been in the emails a bunch of times, you should be able to get to the website, see other creative thons, um, go through the collaborators list, see their emails if you want to reach out to anybody. Um, find some FAQs, get information on like where to fill out your invoice, how to fill out your invoice, how to fill out your W-9. Um, and you can also like us on Facebook where we are sharing a bunch of events that some of you have linked in the chat and some of you have spoken about publicly. And so I'm just going through everybody's like kind of their own Facebook pages and retweeting stuff. I mean, re, I, I don't know. I don't use Facebook like that, but posting. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. reposting it. It'll be on the Facebook page. Um, that's always fun. So we can all just share information and attend each other's events. And so if you search Climate Justice Initiative, you can just like it by clicking on the like button. All right, thanks, Adriana. Do you want to do, do this, Ron? I have no idea what this is. Okay, Sorry. I'll do it. All right. So the next time we're all meeting together is Sunday, May 2nd, 1 to 5. 
And that is when we're doing our big workshops. So it's a four hour gathering. And that's when we're coming up with the collective message for the mural and other content for the mural. That's probably one of the most important meetings because once that is set, that will be the structure the mural is built on. Those decisions will inform the creative disruptions that people select. So that's a very key and that's an interactive workshop. It's led by Center for Story-Based Strategy. All of you have links to do the self-guided um, lesson, but they exclusively work with developing messages with people who are organizations who are environmental or climate justice. So they're really important folks for us to work with. And in order to do that work, they ask us to do something called the cornerstones. So that we have now developed as an online form. You can do it yourself. Maybe you need about 15 minutes, but if you wanna do it together, um, we're gonna to do one session for an hour on, that's Wednesday, April 14th, six to 7 p.m. All your answers feed up to a form. We count people's answers. And um, if you don't participate, it means that your voice will not be in the input for story-based strategy to structure what, um, what the part of the messaging. The mural design review sessions, there's three of them. There is no doubt that the possibility of these dates changing, ch may change. So the first one is concept, the second one's rough design, and the final one is final design. Um, what's also upcoming or planning paint days, that's for people who want to opt in to the second phase of the project where you want to have paint days in your community and with the folks you work with. It's totally optional because when we have the mural, we're going to have the hub, we're going to have all this publicity and all these teach-ins and workshops. So you do not have to participate in paint days if it doesn't fit what you or your organization is um, doing. And then we're gonna show you some upcoming stuff around graphic design support for organizations. And then finally, finally, we'll have a reflection evaluation conversation. Next slide. So the purpose of the workshop with story-based strategy is to weave all of our stories into a shared narrative, but to maintain unique elements of each story and but highlight these common themes. So once again, We'll, we'll, um, Adriana will send you out a bulletin that has all these links, but we encourage you to do this. After we do the training with story-based strategy, we will no longer have access to that online training. You can do a Zoom training with your own folks if you wanna practice your messaging and um, think about other ways of framing what you do. So right now that's like a, something you can take and use. And I, I encourage you to do it. I know we've done it. Some of us have done it like three or four times now. It's super helpful. Next slide. Those are the cornerstones. Emma, are you going to talk about that? Sure, yeah. The project cornerstone, Shari talked very briefly about, but this is an activity that originated with story-based strategy and these questions about goals, audience, target, constituency um, will help orient the na narrative reframing, reframing and development we'll do together in our next assembly. Um, so as Shari said, we invite you to do this on your own time if you want to do it as a Google form, um, but we did it as a strategy circle as a group activity and it was a great group activity. Um, so if you're available to join us on Wednesday the 14th at 6 p.m. we'd love to, to do it collectively. Next slide. Those are the dates for design review. Everyone elected Tuesday night as their best night. So um, I just want to say we don't have the final authorization on the wall. So this could all blow up and that happens in public art. But um, the concept review is probably the most important review because that's the framework that everything hangs on. So coming in at final design, everything is already predetermined. We're like fine tuning things at final design. So you really, really, really wanna attend concept review and rough design review. That's when it all happens. It's really just, I can't tell you how important it is because right now this circle, these circles have developed this knowledge and this understanding of each other. You can always go back and review the presentations by clicking through or you can watch the videos of them. 
And so there's all this knowledge in this group and all these recognitions of things. So it's really, what do you wanna lift up? Just like when we saw in that climate march, what they lift up was that they're the ones who have the, the um, they're in the forefront of the change. So we have the paint day information session directly following. So after the concept review, you can have a little break and then we'll talk about paint days. So if you wanna learn about the paint days before you commit, you can do it that way, but we'll do it. We link them together so that trying to take the least amount of people's lives in the spring when we know everyone's so busy. So these are tentative dates, but they're based on what you wanted and what you voted for. And hopefully that wall is gonna come through like this week. We'll just all cross our fingers. Next slide. Yeah, and, and the communication circle has also been working with the graphic designer. I sure you mentioned briefly at the start of this kind of update. Um, her name is Jer Jeremy Rosenbro. I think some of you were able to meet her at the kickoff meeting. Um, and she's been working on completing a branding package, which is um, full of all these wonderful design elements. There are some mocked up on the slide, including the logo for the Climate Justice Initiative, the color palettes, some mock-ups of some posters that either focus on individuals or on quotes, um, and then some Instagram kind of square social media graphics um, that can also be used to promote events or individuals or specific actions. Um, and one of the goals of this initiative is to bolster the efforts of project participants and their organizations, including the events you may have or you want to promote and your practices to right environmental injustices. But in order to be able to promote the work that you do, we really need some material. So there was a form that went out in the last bulletin that asks for some things like headshots, logo, shots in action. Um, and we can pull some of this information from the introductory presentations that you all put together for the kickoff, but some of you weren't able to, didn't participate in that introductory slide, so we may not have collateral from you already, and Google Slides has a tendency to kind of compress the quality of the photos, and we'd really, if it's possible, like to access high-resolution images that we can use to promote um, the work that you do and make sure that we're bolstering um, you know, the, the efforts that you guys are putting into this, this environmental justice work. Um, so it, it is essential in order to bolster your work that you respond to that survey. And I know that there are, it takes a lot of time to put that content together. So if we can support you in any way, if it's easier for you to email it to me instead of to fill out the form, whatever we can do to support you in submitting that content um, would be really helpful for us. Emma, can you tell folks how far away we are from being ready to use this material? Because people are sending us events and um, we can't put, put them in yet. We're not quite there. How far away are we? I think in two weeks, we'll get the final design files from Jeremy. And then if you guys have any events or anything that you want us to plug information into the kind of branded material, we can help with any of that communications and PR efforts. And we can also, as we're bolstering this project, make sure to bolster your events and the efforts that you all are doing with your organizations using mural arts PR and the mural arts um, audience as well. Um, Emma, can you put a link in the, in, the, in the chat with the slide deck where people can put their um, headshots in their bio? Yeah, we'd actually prefer if you all submitted it using the Google form, which was in the bulletin, and that will go out oh, okay. again with the Zoom link on Wednesday, and I can link the Google form in the chat as well. Um, but the Google form won't compress your images, whereas if you drop the photo into oh, Google whoa. Slides, it will compress the quality. So we are hoping that if it's possible that you submit using the Google form if you have that capacity. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Is there another slide? Yes, uh, so yeah, Victoria, could you bring us back to um, to the no, no slides anymore? So this is the last slide. Yeah, take us to just to see each other. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, and All also right. Jonathan was not here today because he's in New Mexico, but he got offered his COVID shot. So of course, normally he, um, he does the uh, facilitation. Ron, thank you so much. You were awesome. Everyone was incredible. Are there any questions before we close? I have a little question about Tuesdays. Um, was there some kind of a vote that I missed or is, that, is Tuesday night the, the time when everybody is free? It was, um, I 
think it Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but Tuesdays got more. Wow. Um, so that was elected as the best night of the week. That's a problem for you, Lynn? No, I'll be there. But I, it, normally, I'm, I'm torn between two to three meetings every Tuesday and Wednesday night, mm. sometimes Thursdays. But I mean, if that's what the group, you know, I just won't go to those things. It's not too many meetings over the next couple of months. And if the wall blows up, <laughs> they'll all be postponed anyway <laughs> so um so anyway we'll i'll just keep praying for that wall and and it, it's not that many meetings so i'm sorry it's inconvenient that's okay, it's okay. Can i get that before yeah and people are asking in the chat if we can send out a follow-up email with all the information that we just gave out so hopefully we can do that um just to keep everybody in the loop and let everyone know what the next steps are and what the next important dates are um, Ron, can I ask one final question? Sure. Um, we, we didn't realize this, but the videos, we knew they were on our little mini site that you all have access to. They were actually live on Mural Arts YouTube sites. They got, the Air Circle got 38 views, some of it was mostly us, but we asked them to not make them accessible until we had your permission. None of the breakout groups are in it and we would cut this part and the beginning part out. So it's just the presentation. Does anyone object to us making them available so you can share them with friends and supporters and all no. that? No, I don't have object to it. Okay, can we, anyone with an objection? This is Ruth Ann. Can we um, correct a few spelling mistakes first and titles? Definitely. Okay, yes. great. thank you. <laughs> yes. Just wanting to do my best. <laughs> Okay, beautiful. We know that people have already been sharing them with other with friends and constituents, but we wanted to just clean up and do that little bit of business. So thank you. Right. Um, yeah, someone asked about saving the chat if, there, if there's a way to do that. I don't know, maybe that's Victoria. Yes, it'll be it'll be saved. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, it's five, it's almost 5.15. We went a little bit over, but honestly, I'm surprised that it's not six or seven o'clock. So, <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it was a really amazing um, presentation. It was. That we, that we watched. Was. I learned so much from all of you and I'm Me looking too. forward to working with you all more in the future. And I hope that you all stay in contact and continue just growing these seeds of connection that we're starting. Um, great job, great job. Looking forward to the next, the next thing. Okay.